We already always had the lights. Yeah, man. Nice. Always had. This is exactly the same. This is it. Yeah, we're just a bigger room. Yeah, I like the bigger room. You like it? I kind of do. Yeah. Different I, vibe, feels, same vibe? Same vibe. You think? But I, yeah. Okay, I, I'm glad to hear Well, that. I like it better. It feels like you've... It doesn't feel as... You can breathe in here. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah, it doesn't feel as condensed. And it's like, well, those ceiling panels are sick. You like it, huh? Especially yeah. with, like, the recent discoveries and I pictures. I know. Well, before we get to that... Yeah. So... They're LEDs, and if I buy a different dimmer, supposedly I'm told that I can dim them down even further. And I think if you dim them down, then the dark areas become black, and everything. Pops yeah, out it's, well, yeah. So I'm gonna, nice. I'm gonna have to explain. play with it. Oh, well, you know, I mean, what else I got to spend my, my goddamn money on? You know, <laughs> just, uh, take the, you know, people talk about like, you know, well, I put a new kitchen; it was a money pit. I'm like, listen, pal, build a fucking studio. You'll yeah, find a money pit. There, right. Exactly. I know, because I was thinking on You'll the way here. You'll find a money pit. Because I know originally you were talking about like, oh, I don't want to monetize this. I don't want to become. I don't. Like, uh, yeah. I'm still fiercely against that. And I, but I got pressures yeah. on me. No, I, no, no, no. I have um, not pressures. I, it's flattering. I've had multiple yeah. organizations approach me. Well, um, sure. That's you got cool. something, man. You yeah, so that's something. all the more reasons not to give in. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like it's almost. I mean, I mean, is it like the? Is it like when the like fans get mad at a underground ba- band that becomes famous? Kinda, like I always think of um, kind of. Well, Grace Potter and the Nocturnals or Liz Fair were two Liz that they were really Fair. pissed off. Yeah. You know, and sometimes that can go against the artists because yeah. the fans can abandon them. Yeah, that shit happens. Right, that's a real thing. Right, like it's. I, and I mean, I got into Grace Potter, I think, late. I got into Grace Potter when she started to break. But, I mean, she's the shit. Like, uh-huh. I love her. Uh-huh. You know? And then it was like, right. Yeah. You know? I, I, I don't know if... um. How do I say this? I was, I was having a conversation with Shannon or somebody in our mutual circle. Mm. And I wanted to bring this up to you when I was driving. Because I knew, I knew this was going to come up. It's flattering, man. I yeah. take every, like, thing that comes to me with gratitude. Mm-hmm. You know? But... The frustrating part is very few people outside of yourself and a handful of other people that I know, my friends that get it, like what right. what we're trying to do here. Right. I would hope that the longer we go, people will kind of like, oh, but man, there's that, there's that, fa- Scott, there is that fascination with money, 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 yes. money at all costs. Yeah. How can it make me money? Right. Right. Yeah, and what is that? And well, you, you know, from uh, just being in the circles you've been in, that fame trap, you've had a really, I would imagine, yeah, real hands-on view of what the and fame I fell trap into that does. Pit. And I felt, I was oh, in the trap. really? Well, and guitar is not not the fame, not so much the fame. Now, don't get me wrong. Yeah. I go to a concert and then you know all these rock and roll fans would know me from my association. Yeah, that's and the a, street stuff. That was a, a that's a thing, man. But but the money thing, be, it's like that money yeah. focus. Yeah. In music is unfortunate. But right. you don't realize it until you leave it and you look back back in on it. Yeah. You know? Now did you have I experienced this. It it's funny, I'll see um Britney Spears shaved her head. I'm like, get it. You know, what uh-huh. Justin Bieber goes through. Uh-huh. Get it. Uh-huh. For Scott sure. Wyland. I always yeah, had a, a lot travesty. of empathy for travesty. Scott Wyland because I'm like, I lost my mind with no money or power. Mm-hmm. You know, even when I had my first art company, a lot of it was like mm-hmm. the blossoming of creativity and that coming out of the box. Yeah. But it was like, I tipped megalomaniac and I was like, Whoop. no money or power. So, I mean, it, it, it I, the, always that quote from uh, Jack Nicholson's Joker, wait till they get a load of me. Mm-hmm. You know, like I would have, they lose their shit. And I'm like, I get it, man. Like I totally. Yeah. I think, I think it's too easy to dismiss it and say, well, how could they like, you know, how can anyone kill themselves when they got everything? And, but it isn't everything Makes it easier. from that person saying it, it might be everything to them, to them. the perception yeah. of it. Yeah. But I just saw, um, now and it's funny that you take four Let's say I met four people in the business of equal, relatively equal stature. Two of them could be really normal people and you know very um, humble, yeah. somewhat. It, yeah. You can call a rock star humble, right. but ultimately like very have it together. Right. And then the other two can be literally barely holding on by a thread. Right. Both went through similar circumstances right. in that environment, but the outcome is different. It's yeah. like life, I guess. It's a reflection of cat- catechism of life. You know? It absolutely is. I 
and not long ago, and it was probably with Shannon or somebody mm-hmm. we know, had that discussion like, what is it? What is it that causes one person to tip? You know, you look at the razor's edge. You look at the 27 Club. Yeah. Jordan Peterson and Russell Brand yep. had a great discussion about that because Brand got sober at 27. Mm-hmm. And Peterson's like, psychologically, mm-hmm. that's one of those tipping point no, don't. times. No, don't. And it's, and it's like, why does people would always say to me, like, how do you have the attitude you have with everything you've been through? And to me, it's just, well, I'm just going to keep going. Right. You know what I mean? But what, why do some things that break people help other people shine Mm -hmm. and grow? Mm -hmm. To me, Mm -hmm. my bedtime story, that's past lives, man. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? New souls aren't equipped. Even if we don't know, Mm -hmm. I feel that's my answer, but that's part of my (laughs) bedtime story. It's, it's, uh, it's frightening to me to a degree because we all could be we're all how do I say this? Let me block this back. In the past year, one of the epiphanies of doing this show and talking to a variety of people and then going deep is that it's obvious to me that our individual realities are completely unique to ourselves. And if we fail to realize that about other people, we're shortchanging ourselves and we're shortchanging them. Like you and I sitting here, we're experiencing this now and we're pretty congruent in the conversation, but the mm-hmm. realities of what the fuck is happening here <laughs> is completely unique to each other. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that most of us don't maneuver in a way that we even give that a passing thought about how we maneuver our lives, right? Yeah. When we deal with each other. No. Oh. And that's been so much peace in my life, whether it be forgiving the mother mm-hmm. or anyone you know what i mean is when i seek to understand exactly. like oh they're just they're doing the best like that was a big thing for parents Bingo. for me like Bingo. you know when i realized my parents had their own they didn't know what the hell they were doing either you know mm-hmm. and i think that's like a um hiccup in our society where we're you know the blessings and curses of capitalistic culture mm-hmm. um is we're we're told to kind of fake it or we're made to think to fake it or I, whatever it is. I don't think it's particular teaching. Like maybe it's shot into the world at 18 and you figure it out. You know what I mean? But like if more of us, I'm Russell Brand and Jordan Peterson. I talk about it all the time, but yeah, right Brand has that. Uh, I think I sent it to you that talk on his 12 step book. Yeah. And he's like, you know, He's telling this story when the cabalist, ca- the cabbie and the bicyclist are about to have a row in the street. They've lost perspective. And if they could look at each other and be like, hey, my father was absentee, like that minute. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, oh, it stops. Like that sort of vulnerability mm-hmm. and like. If we could that, get to that point. If we could just get that we just. I don't know, man. I mean. Okay, so about it. We, last time you and I went one on one here was too long, but it's yeah. about a year ago. Right, about a year ago. So, yeah. in this past year, I mean, can can you give me any semblance of hope that society might be slowly, yes, getting better? I love that we don't prepare. That's Never. very exciting to me. For this but the show? one, yeah, no, I know why. I know, but that's it. That's beautiful. Not with you and I, anyway. No. So. Um, no. But I, there was one topic I really wanted to talk about that's probably been the ongoing theme. Like when I thought, well, what's happened since I last yeah. saw him one-on-one? Yeah. And it's like creative wellness. And we'll mm-hmm. dig into this more. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to think, how do I start this? Um, the Age of Aquarius. Mm-hmm. They sung about it in the 60s. Yeah. We're in it now. This is supposed to be about the time of healing. Okay. This is supposed to be about the time of awakening. You know, and... All these terrible stories, you know, that were told on the news about the pandemic. Right. Because I go into the world in the manner I which I go into and try to get to know people deeply on a daily mm-hmm. basis, even if I have them for five minutes, I'm not hearing those stories, man. Like I'm hearing beautiful stories of rediscovering themselves, of changing careers, of valuing their time, their own time and their time with other people. You know, and the one arcing theme is this creative wellness piece. So it's um, 
it's healing through the arts. You know, I had an experience, uh, a friend of mine and I went to the symphony lights on Mm -hmm. whenever they did that before the symphony, it was like their prelude. And it was cool because he talked about like, you all grew up with classical music, like Bugs Bunny. And I was like, Ooh, that's flight of the Valkyries, man. Kill the Wabbit is flight is Wagner. (laughs) But yep. I cried, man. And symphonies, things like that, a lot of that, it really touches me. You know what Mm -hmm. I mean? Like it affects me deeply. And I've had the idea of like, to me, those are the modern prophets. The creatives are the modern prophets, Mm -hmm. you know, whatever you believe Mm -hmm. in. Um, If you look at the old books, you know, the, 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 the big black book or whatever, Gideon's Bible, all the Bibles, like there's stories of God's approach to humans evolving, Mm-hmm. You know, what I mean? changing, switching up. And it's like, we don't have any prophets anymore. Like, what happened? You know, we had the last guy, you know, 2000 plus years ago. To me, it's the creatives. It's things like this. And this is a creative venture. It's the songwriters. It's the people that make movies, write novels, poetry. Like, what is creativity? Creativity is an awakening. Mm-hmm. You know, it is open your eyes. It's, I'm going to, you know, you hear a song at the right time and it's just like, it's everything. It's your whole world, you know? Yeah. And, um, you know, those, the creatives do that to heal themselves. And then hopefully somebody said the other day, a musician said the other day to be of service. And I was like, wow. Like he said it. That's interesting. He like said it. And I was like, damn, like that's, that's intense. Cause I'm like, you know, to heal ourselves and then hopefully heal others. You know, when you can go on and he was like, yeah, to be of service. I'm like, wow. You know, cause we talked about this. Mm-hmm. If you asked me to be in life before I got sober right. nine years ago, I'd have given you a self-centered answer today. Mm-hmm. We're here to help each other. Period. Mm-hmm. That's it. Mm-hmm. How can we do that on a daily basis? So there's things like art therapy and music therapy now, but what I'm personally trying to push and what has been the last year is the discussion by the creatives, a very, very open discussion about creative wellness, about the healing that comes from the arts. Okay. Because I don't think it's talked about that much. Like the creatives know. Okay. You know, and people that are in tune with that, that are affected by a symphony or a song. And I don't think even everybody fully understands it. We feel it. And we're like, okay, that hole in my chest feels better now. I feel like that was, you've heard people say, oh, that was a message from my mother, grandfather. You Mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like that song at that time. Mm -hmm. So I don't think the large population of the people understand that that is a a healing sort of thing. And to me, one of my driving forces right now is to like really, really, really begin this discussion by the creatives outwardly. To say this is what we're doing and this is why. When we you do say it. with creatives, you're including artists in regards. Yeah, to that. creative has been the new like the thing because artists can be limiting. Artists are like yeah. you know they think about that painting or something like that, and then if you say musician, then you just think music. Right. Creatives is poets. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, poets, painters, photographers. What about and, uh, people that create businesses? Create out uh, create. Uh, create is that is that too much of a stretch is that i think for the like no it's one of my things is to make make <laughs> get people to realize everybody they're creative like when i had my gallery back in 09 in the factory artist's first incarnation mm-hmm. i saw the therapeutic value of creativity okay you know this gallery was open all the time had musicians i mean robin fernandez was like i like what you're doing here's my vision my vision, his vision matched up. Right. It was like, let's just be open. And so there was dance and there was music and there was art and there was all those things. And I started these like social experiments where somebody would walk in and I'd be like, hey, what's your art? Oh, I'm not an artist. Well, what's your story? Oh, I don't have a story. Everybody's got a story. And through their story, I'd try to pull out, this is the way you're creative. Okay. You know, and then I'd do um, this one. I, I mean, I do both. Not that one as much. This one still today. I'll ask people who's the greatest. I used to say artist until this week, creative of all time. And they're like, uh, I'm like, it's a, it's a stream of consciousness, thought experiment. You already have five names in your head, you know, and they paint to Picasso, 
you know, pink. I didn't even mean to say pink. I meant to say Prince, <laughs> but whatever. Prince pink, to Picasso. Prince. Yeah. And then it's a doesn't matter. It's a trick question. Now right. everybody knows the trick question. But I, then I'll say, hey, you ever see a sunset that takes your breath away? You know, the Cherry Blossom Festival in D.C. Sit in Death Valley under a new moon. Right. Whatever created the, all of this, in either camp, if you're an atheist scientist and you believe the Big Bang created everything and we have stardust in our genes, which mm -hmm. we do, or you believe in multiple gods or a monotheistic god and we're made in the image of that, whatever created everything is the greatest artist of all time or creative. Mm -hmm. And so that's in us. So it's a, just about drawing that out. Okay. You know, even the work I did in rehabs, I started a writing program and I'd have a 60 year old housewife alcoholic and she'd be like, I can't write. She, everybody can write. Certainly. And she would write these unbelievable things. Mm -hmm. So that's like a big thing for me ever since 09 is like trying to pull creativity out. Okay. So yeah, I change it from artist to just creative. Because I think people. It's, it's such a convoluted term. And I term. didn't even answer it's your just, question. No, no, it's such a convoluted term, though. Let's mm. go there. I mean, the, you know, and I think that our our current social media platforms kind of screw that up a little bit because mm -hmm. now all these companies are marketing to creatives, so to speak. And, and I, I love the idea of people feeling that they could be or can be a creative person, but mm -hmm. I think the definition now has been kind of bastardized. Yeah, yeah. To a degree. I didn't think about it like that. Yeah, it's that's hard. But yeah, creating business is actually absolutely creative. I tell people raising kids is creative. Now when I'm talking about the creative wellness, I'm more talking about the the people that I saw this great book that I never read in that Penguin Bookshop in Swickley Swickley once it was called The Fringe. And it talks about how the fringe of society pushes real social change. Mm -hmm. You know, we have that core dem democracy. Um, but it's the fringe and, and they describe like the artists, Yeah, you know what I mean? The musicians, the writers. I mean, a lot of what I've been talking about, we do a lot of jazz at the mm -hmm. place at, at Kingfly Spirits. There's your plug. There you go. There you go. Um, and one of the things I've been talking about a lot, man, like I got to go and see real jazz when I was a kid. My dad was a big oh, yeah. jazz fan. So yeah, like I was at proper course. jazz clubs. Right on. When did jazz become a golf clap? Wait, what? Like a golf club. This is what we do to jazz now. Oh, like, really? Yeah, when? I, I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. Like a listening listening room jazz where it's like, yeah, man. That's interesting. And not everywhere. That's interesting. But it's, to me, it was, I mean, look what jazz was. Jazz was an awakening. Mm -hmm. And more so, jazz was bringing together all cultures. I mean, why did they, why were they, why was the FBI after Billie Holiday? Mm-hmm. Because it was an awakening. It was waking right. people up. And it was bringing people together. Yeah. You know what I mean? So there's that. I always say we whitewash jazz. <laughs> you know? I think it, that's a pretty accurate statement. Yeah. There's a different environment. And there's so many kinds of jazz. I had Kenny yeah. Blake on here. We had an amazing conversation. Nice. You know Kenny, right? Yeah. Well, not personally. No of. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I always admired Kenny because I was exposed to jazz, um, all kinds of jazz through yeah. my uncle years ago. And mm. I knew, uh, I knew I would go see Kenny play, mm -hmm. but I hadn't seen him in a long time, 20 plus years, sat down with mm. him. And I, we were talking about, uh, what is jazz? It's almost mm. impossible to define the people. People mm -hmm. argue about rock and roll. Well, okay. Right. You think yeah. that's a, that's a broad argument. Try yeah. to define jazz. Right. Right. Really? Yeah. I mean, jazz could be clarinet Benny Goodwin. It could be Miles Davis. It could be Return to Forever and all this crazy guitar fusion mm -hmm. stuff, right? I mean, then it goes all the way. I think there's an element of R&B in jazz. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's like it's just cool jazz, R&B jazz, modern jazz. Experimental fusion, jazz. Experimental <laughs> acid jazz. All kinds of shit. Right? Well, look at the evolution of music. I remember like when my brother-in-law dropped on me he was like the irish had a hand in the blues and i was like wait what yeah so he the story he told is that 
because the indentured servant Irish that came over to this country came over. Some of them came over on the slave boats with slaves. Okay, you know they'd stop in Ireland and pick up the slaves, and so the sla- The story is the slaves heard the sad Irish folk songs, which is where slave music came from, like plantation music came from, and the fusion of those two led into. Like the blues. I mean, when we look at the evolution of music, it's from the first caveman banging on a rock or whatever. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, there's always that. I mean, everything leads off. No, certainly. It all builds. One right? another. Nothing's, yeah. Nothing's purely original. Right. So we, I had these experiences, you know, um, at Brick Shop when I was launching the restaurant in the uh, Trip Hotel. And it was bringing in a bunch of jazz musicians and like wanting to give Roger Humphreys a home again because the James Street closed and Mm -hmm. that was like his home for so long. Mm -hmm. So I started jam sessions with a buddy of mine and um, we really, these jam sessions, you were getting everything. You were getting all of it. You know, he could have a trio of like the classic, you know, standard jazz stuff, but then you're bringing in different horn players, different singers and, you know, that, and I met this Cuban drummer, Hugo Cruz. If you haven't seen him yet, man. Okay. Like, he's unbelievable. The first night, so I had Roger there at Brick Shop. So eventually when it built up, then I invited Roger in. Okay. So he's there. I introduced the two of them. And during the set, Roger gets up from his set. That was the first night he met Hugo and hands him the sticks. Hugo sits down, you know, and starts playing. And that night he was like, we should do a series with like two drummers. You know, full band, mm-hmm. but like two percussion. You do that in jazz. That, yes. is, that is jazz. Right? Mm-hmm. So we started, no rules. when I went to Kingfly, um, we started the Sunday project and the first, uh, he calls it the voice of drums, was with Roger, you know, and that night, like, something changed, I feel like. Like, it's, Hugo's already super electric, man. Mm-hmm. And this guy is not only an amazing, even Roger looks at him and goes, I don't know how his hands move in the way that they move. You know, and he's this beautiful soul. Like, Mm -hmm. you just fall in love with this guy. And he's also, like, got a master's in music. Mm -hmm. Like, he did a thing at the Cabaret Theater that was, like, a PowerPoint presentation on the influence of Afro-Cuban and Cuban music on American jazz. And did a performance. (laughs) (laughs) But it's like that. Like, now he he plays the first Sunday of every month at Kingfly during our, our open creative Sundays. Okay. And, dude, there's no demographic in the room. Yeah, there can't be. There isn't. I get it. Yeah. I and it's, it. and it's, so it's watching this evolution of just what he's doing and in, in, even in doing it in the space at Kingfly. Like, you know, he'll always call me up to say a few things. And I'm like, look around you, like black, white, Latino, gay, mm-hmm. straight, trans, young, old men. There's no Democrat. That's what jet, to me, that's what jazz is. I would agree. You know, that bringing, everybody together because it can be so many different things i mean that was the genre that i mean it it was funny because it was easier for record company executives to create genres in popular music and rock and rap and r&b heavy metal but there was just no way they were ever going to really Mm -hmm. do that effectively in jazz which Mm -hmm. was the beauty of it Mm -hmm. that like takes i met a guy it was the last time hugo's there so the first sunday of this month and um He walked in, I don't know, and I love everybody, so we're BSing and I'm inviting him in, and he's like, man, I haven't felt this type of energy in a room since the James Street. Okay. And then later on in the night we were talking, and I talked about all this, you know, the whitewashing of the jazz and and Mm -hmm. the whole, and the energy, because a rock concert, you never see people sitting down and not cheering. No. Like, the musicians feed off that, man. Of course, they need it. And why isn't that happening? And it's not that it isn't happening in jazz because there's plenty of, I'm sure, great jazz rooms, you know, where where that sort of energy is still happening. But um, he was talking about his brother got him into jazz and he was telling this story of like, you know, they listen to, you know, hip hop and soul and R&B and all that. And then his brother got into jazz, got him into jazz. And he, he said to his brother, like, so what's the di- why why jazz? I think was the question, and he was like, like it's spiritual. It has soul. Mm-hmm. He's like, you go to a club and you're listening to this, or you know, even the origins of, you know, um, rap with you know Run DMC or NWA. There was it was about social change and things like that, but it wasn't like feel good music. Mm-hmm. 
mm-hmm. you know, and he's like, jazz is, is, is good for your soul. And I was just like, wow. And what you said, like, jazz is something you shouldn't be able to contain, maybe. That's how I feel about it. Right. Yeah. And because it's bigger than all of us. Maybe it is. Did you see that movie Soul, that Disney cartoon? I have not seen that. Dude. I have not seen you it. You have to see it. It's unbelievably brilliant. Okay. Like, people can call Disney an evil empire, and I'm like, but look. Look at that. Put, yeah. It's beautiful, because it's all things. But he's a jazz musician. So, to me, jazz requires the intent to want to listen it's com- generally it's more complex there's more complexity jazz music than mm-hmm. than the re- re- the repetitive beat of like a pop song mm-hmm. or even a rock song it <clears throat> takes more effort to immerse yourself in the moment and i think that might be part of the limiting exposure of it yeah you agree or disagree it was funny because i was disagreeing at first but like to, when you said to immerse, that's a different ball game. Intentionally. Yeah, intentionally immerse. I think doing it, one of the things that's happened to me since getting sober is concerts are so much better. Really? Whether it be seeing the symphony you do can Wagner. remember them. <laughs> yeah, but, but, but it, they're more, for me, more immersive. Where And I had this like vibe my whole life, like, you know, mm, I've seen Aerosmith like five times and I would never drink or do drugs when I went and saw Aerosmith. So it was like there, hey, I want to really experience this. But it wasn't the same way. I think I went to see with a buddy up in Cleveland, like 21 Pilots or something. And like I felt everything. And then I saw Jack White, dude, on his Blunderbuss tour. (sighs) But it's that, um, the symphony. Like I, I sat there and went through everything Wagner. I feel like what Wagner went through when he was writing Flight of the Valkyries, like the insanity, the sunny meadow feel, like I felt it all. And then I had this experience. So in sept- last September, the owner of King Fly came to me and he said, the Steelers are going to kill us. And then my brain went, mm-hmm. and then two days later we had coffee. I said, do one of two things, do nothing and they'll kill us or just let me try something. And it was, so we started this project that's an open creative Sunday. So if you're creative, I don't care if you keep bees and make honey, you make candles, you take pictures, come in, set up cell for the day. And we'll look about, you know, you submit it to being in there full time. And then I turned all the music over to the musicians. And the only ask was give us an, an hour of open jam. So a musician can walk in off the street and ha- possibly sit in with some of the most brilliant musicians and up and coming and musicians in Pittsburgh. And so I met all these amazing people, but even in the formation of a project, um, I went to alphabet city to see Hugo <clears throat> and it was like during the height of all this. So everybody's sitting down with mask on and like, I see in the corner, like by this pillar, just one shadow, like up and grooving. And I was like, what? and I went out to smoke, came back in and she was sitting at the bar. And I was like, hey, I saw you grooving over there. And she was like, I saw you because your face is fancy. <laughs> and so her name's Mai Koi. Your, 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 <laughs> your face, face is, fancy. is fancy. I was like, oh, that's your get. I love your you. Your face? I love you already. It's fancy. Yes. <laughs> so her name is Mai Koi, and she's one of the city asylum artists, you know, and she's from Vietnam. And so it was right when I was percolating this idea. So we got together, together I had coffee. I told her. Like, and I don't even remember what the conversation then was. I think it was probably an open creative networking collaborative because this is what Factory Artist was years ago. It was everything. So I'm like, I kind of want to make good on what happened back then and, and really do this proper now that I'm straightened out and less crazy. I mean, just crazy in a well, good that's way. that's debatable. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. But... um so then I went, she does this show called The Bad Activist where she tells her story, which the is bad just activist. The Bad Activist. Yeah. And I don't want to like... I know a few of those. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to spoil it, but she was like a big deal in the pop world and okay. then started to speak out and was like, okay. had to, you know, City Asylum, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, and that's how she ended up there. So I went to see her show and she had already started talking to people. So I'd meet... Ben Bar, Dr. Ben oh, yeah. Barson, who's the, you know, he was like, yep. yep, I know what you're doing. I'm in. And I was just like, whoa. And then met this, un- I watched, 
She had Ben Marson, Mark McKelly, Eli and the May, Hugo. Like her band was ridiculous. Right. And all transplants. Right. I actually, I don't know where Ben's from. But a lot of them are transplants from other cities. But well, I'm certainly. watching this piano player and I'm like, who is this dude? And I say kid. I mean, he's in his 30s. But to me, I guess he's a kid. Because he was you electric, think? man. I mean, I was just like, whoa. So I meet him at the after party and he's like, hey, I have this project I want to do. He was in UC Irvine, followed his advisor to Pitt for his doctoral, said, I don't want to do a paper. Can I do a community project? So he like elevator pitched me this idea. So the idea is you have these classically trained musicians or classic jazz, which is very rigid. Mm -hmm. It's a completely open improv lab. So they, there's no structure whatsoever. It's to free these men and women, these brilliant musicians from, I got to do it this way. The so rigidity. It's a, yeah, brilliant project. And when it first happened, I love the idea of the project. I didn't necessarily understand it. And this is stories coming around. You know, it was like, okay, whatever. But then um, Patrick Briner is a sax player. Okay. Him and Eli and May, I want watched all these guys do this. It's called the Tough Pill. He does it at that. Uh, oh gosh, darn it! What's that record store in in Northside? Why can't I think of the name of it? Mm. Ah, well, this well, it'll come back. But um, I watched them do it, and and when the owner of Kingfly gave me back like programming jazz, I wanted these guys in. Okay. Super experimental, fun stuff. Okay. So Thursday night, in what, in what vein? Like what, like acid jazz? What oh that? God, I don't know if there I don't is. Know that I don't anymore. even write. I don't even know that I have the education to understand what it. You know, if I can genre it, because it was very experimental, a lot like the Open Improv Lab, where it was just kind of like. Well, here I'll explain the story. So Sundays, I'm like I'm on the floor, a million people want to talk and I don't get to sit down and really watch it, okay. you know? So as much as I love the idea of their project, I didn't necessarily understand it. And that Thursday night, like I came back, it was the first time and I always want the musicians to feel loved. That's part of, sure. I think what makes me like a good booking person is they know they they know I love them, right. you know? And uh, so I sat down and watched this and had a whole immersive experience. Like it was a, similar format where it was there was no structure they were just playing off each other but i had this moment that there was no difference between what wagner did and what these three musicians uh, right were doing and they were just playing off you know like a jam mm -hmm. session mm -hmm. where it's just mm -hmm. and they were just playing off each other and that's the night like i fully got it like that's what the experimental or open improv mm -hmm. is is they're playing off each other mm -hmm. and they're not only taking each other on a journey they're trying to take us on a journey so yeah, when you were people, talking people about were that it? i mean you could oh yeah but you have to immerse you you have yeah. to understand it with intent yes that's the thing and that's where i think it, it, it takes a certain I, again when i say it takes a certain type of individual that's that's stereotypical i don't like it it takes an individual at that moment who wants to to give the intent mm -hmm. to immerse themselves. Mm -hmm. Does that make any sense? Absolutely. It, it takes that or it takes somebody introducing them to it. So I started with the Sunday thing. I started to like, I'm on the floor and like people come in, if they had a weird look on their face, I would explain the project. And once I explained the project, they loved it. Mm -hmm. You know, the idea of it. And it's about creative wellness. It's mm -hmm. about, we have this, um, these university programs and even, you know, high school and middle school and whatever, we have these programs where like stick to this. Right. Like even with music in creatives, don't put us in a box. Creatives mm -hmm. were not meant to be put in a box and look what music's doing, mm -hmm. especially that sort of music, you know? And I think that's where like jazz breaks a lot of those rules, but no question, you know, when it became this, um, we had to get a master's or a doctorate or, you know, to be qualified. Right. Yeah. I mean, we're, qualifications for music's kind of like insane. Right. You know, it's, yeah, it, it's, you know, Winston Bell, who's Pooji Bell's mm -hmm, son. Mm -hmm. I don't need, he's like 19, 20 year old. He's like on national things. Right. He didn't go de get a doctoral. He's just well, like a prodigy, man. There's, a, you know, you can count probably in popular music. 
I mean, because Berkeley School of Music is like the de facto standard, right? It's, it's the creme de la creme, whether mm-hmm. it's guitar or piano <coughs> and popular music. But you can count on probably two hands the amount of popular musicians you right. can name that actually went there. Yeah, and, so what's, and most what of them it? are in jazz. It's all about money. Mm-hmm. That's it. Generally. You know, there's this woman I met through. Do you know Pearl Ann Porter? She'd be a good one to put on mm-hmm. your thing. She has the space upstairs. Which is above, I always say conjunction, junction, but construction, junction. Construction. And she has the Pello Project, which is like an interpretive dance thing. But the space upstairs is this, like, I haven't even been yet, so it's funny for me to say. Um, But it's a creative space. Jeff Berman was like, dude, it's the only thing that reminds me of New York. Okay. So it's this, like, open creative space. And and she just told me last week, because I was going to go see Jeff there. And uh, she's like, oh, we got, she knows I'm sober. Everybody knows I'm sober. So she's like, oh, we got great coffee and tea. And I was like, oh, is it BYOB? And she's like, no, it's a sober space. And I was like, oh. How about that? Yeah. And it's. How's that work? It's to allow people to fully immerse. Mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. That's what instinctually, because we didn't go into it. But anyways, I met her friend, um, Bree Short. And Bree was a dancer. Right. And I think, gosh. I think like Boston Conservatory or something serious. Okay. And she's okay. like, she's like, well, there was a practice room. I taught myself piano. How about that? And she's ridiculous. Yeah. How about that? Yeah. It's like, oh, d- does she have a degree? No. But like, go watch her play and you'll cry. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And like, she's one of those people that came into my life recently that's, that's, it's very clear, I think, in some musicians specifically. Or, or when you say creatives, writers, poets, whatever. But Brie, to me, it's very clear she's she's going through, she's sorting through her stuff. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like a lot of music, you can be like, mm, it's very clear what they're doing. Sure. Oh, you know? yeah, for certain. Yeah, for certain. and she's got this like, I don't know, theater vibe. But you know what I mean? And it wasn't even her so much saying anything to me about it. Like we had a discussion later about it, but. Like it, it was just clear. It's like, oh, she's, she's going through her stuff, you know. So it's that, again, that idea of creative wellness. Because the minute I talked to her about it, she was like, oh yeah, absolutely, you know. And she's involved in a project that we're doing. Um, it's an immersive theater experience. So there's this. Okay. This. So I'm. <laughs> all right. I'll just tell it. Who cares? So Pearl Ann's sitting at the bar with this stunning woman, and I'm like. <laughs> I love my job. I'm going to go interrupt that conversation. And it was Bree. And uh, yeah. And uh, Pearl Ann's like, hey, Bree's a musician. You know, you should have her play here. And I was like, yeah, shoot me an email. I'll get you a gig here. And uh, the next day I was telling the owner about her. And he's like, what's she doing tonight? Because we didn't have anything going on that night. And I was like, I don't know. I text her. She came in. And when she came in, she was like, hey, I got a friend that wants to do a project here where you talk to her. I'm like, yeah, absolutely. So I met Kaylin that night and um, I was like, sat down like, all right, what do you want to do? And she gave me like this brief overview and I was like, all right, let's do it. You know, let's have a planning meeting. But they were talking about there's this thing called um, Sleep No More in New York. Okay. And it's. And it's Macbeth family. I don't think it has anything to do with the play or anything like that. It's just that's the basis. But it's this immersive theater experience. I still immersive have to go up. And, yeah, I still have to go up and see it because I don't fully understand. Sounds it. a little freaky. Yeah, <laughs> but isn't that good? <laughs> Could be. So it's not like you're sitting down. You're the the general idea that that. I got from it is it's like it's happening around you and okay. you could go in the bathroom and there could be an actor there and you could get a piece of the puzzle and people are always like like dinner murder mystery dinner no different but it's like a, I said to Kaylin I was like is this a big thing and she was like Ariana Grande was in my last group like it's a re and they've been doing it for like 10 years I think wow. it's a thing so she gives me the brief pitch and I'm because we get a lot of opportunities to do different things there because the owner's open-minded about trying different things. Um, I'm like, all right, great. People come to me with ideas all the time. All right, let's see. It's not grotesque. It's not vulgar. Let's give it a shot. And I love like being able to like stoke that, like give people a chance. I mean, my thing oh, for sure. from factory artist was about the emerging artist. Oh, for sure. You know, I love helping the emerging artist, you know, that's one of the, like with jazz is mm-hmm. a big thing, you know, mm-hmm. imagine the, 
people that came up under Roger and things like that, you know? Right on. So um, we have the, the first planning meeting, and she's like, well, I need a writer to write the story. And I was like, I write. <laughs> she's like, all right, done. So I'm writing a short story that Brie is going to compose. Okay. It's going to help Brie compose, and it's going to help all the actors. So I'm basically doing – she did, like, you know, short character development the first time she did it. And um, I'm just going to expand character development. Okay. And then the actors are going to get a say in it. Kaylin's going to get a say in it. Bree's going to write the score of it. But it's this immersive, well, November 13th at Kingfly Spirits. Immer- November 13th. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm going to keep you posted. Don't so, worry. So there's rehearsals and everything? The, ooh, we're in very much, she developed the story okay. um, already. And she just wants to make it bigger. You know what I mean? So the the general story story's already developed. And it's I mean, it's dancing, it's music, it's acting, it's like the fusion of like all these different things in this one experience. Like Kingfly will be open and you buy tickets and you go to this thing and it, it'll be like three runnings. So you could get like a piece of the puzzle okay. each different times. Okay. But I mean it's she wants to bring in lighting from New York and dancers from Miami and like we're we're writing grants. Like to fund this That's thing, insane. yeah, and it doesn't exist in Pittsburgh. Obviously not. And I've been saying for years, like I want to do things that they do in New York. Mm-hmm. You know, in Pittsburgh, even just the creatives <clears throat> that I've interacted with since starting, it's like thirty-eight weeks of doing this open creative Sundays: New York, Chicago, Boston, L.A., Singapore, Cuba, Milan, Italy. Something's happening in Pittsburgh right now. Interesting. That is drawing. All these creatives. What do you think it is? Well, if the point. It's an energy vortex. You think? That's the when you that's the basis of it. I won't give human beings credits for anything. <laughs> it all comes from spirit. But I think I mean the point's an energy vortex. So at the core that's what it is. But it's all these other cities are pricing them out. Interesting. And so the evolution to me looking at the Pittsburgh food scene. That just blew up. So the chefs come in, creatives come in, Mm -hmm. the fringe Mm -hmm. to create a scene. And then you have, I mean, somebody told me the other day, like 70 craft breweries in Pittsburgh. Pretty much from what I understand. It's like one of the top three in the country now. It's insane. Look at all the distilleries we have. You Mm -hmm. know what I mean? I mean, the stuff, even though I don't drink, the spirits at Kingfly are insane. Right. You know what I mean? Like, I wouldn't recommend my path to anyone sober. But like, I taste you know, taste and spit, because how can I give an opinion if I don't do it? You mm-hmm. know, I'm not imbibing. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's insane. I mean, the place does 13 different spirits. Like, show that me a insane. distillery anywhere yeah, in the world. Insane. It's bananas. That is crazy. And they're brilliant. But it's, to me, chefs, breweries, distilleries, so they create that. And we already had our medical field. We had mm-hmm. CMU and all sure. the universities. But then to me, that's for the creatives. It's that creative market, building a cool creative scene with food and drink that I think is part of what draws creatives. But I think I mean, so. Yeah. I think so. They're, I met a couple. They're from Singapore. Now he works in robotics. So that's how he ended up in Pittsburgh. But I'll still give credit to the spirit. <laughs> you know what I mean? For It's like this beacon you know, that draws people. All right. So last time you were here, you were talking about two things. You were talking about a book. That yes. I've been working on. Getting, yeah. Getting an Finished. On that. Yeah. It is done. Shannon helped me with that. It is done. It is done. It is in developmental edits right now. Developmental so edits. What does that exactly mean? Through Shannon, I met a jewelry maker and I bought a piece of jewelry off her. She made me a piece of jewelry, and then her husband is a publishing consultant. Okay. So because I bought jewelry off her, he advised me for free. Oh, right on. And now it's funny because we have to have another appointment because I think I misread him. But I was like, I don't have money. I don't have any money to pay you to be my publishing consultant. You know. So he's like, I thought he said, give it to your friends for developmental edits. So basically, it's to like make sure it flows. Okay. Does it make sense? Because once you, like, once I write something, I can do my edits, but then my eyes can't well, see it any yeah, other. Certainly. That's, I think it's natural. Yeah. For- so that's what I gave it to a bunch of friends. 
No one's got back to me yet. Which either means they just haven't read or it sucks. the fuck out, Scott. Yeah, probably. <laughs> hopefully. Hopefully. <laughs> Part of my uh, yeah, yeah, uh, ex- existential crisis isn't a bad thing. But it's e- – yeah. So it's developmental edits. Then I'll get it, Can give it to an editor. Can you give us the gist of what, what the story is? Yeah. It's called Awakenings, the Crossroads series. Mm-hmm. So it's a bunch – it's seven different people. So there's seven characters. Is it it's fiction. Based- it's fiction meets reality. I had um, – yeah. I had a um, – I was working on my two-part memoir. First part, Confessions of the Ringleader, View from the Rabbit Hole. That's the – Growing up, descent in the darkness. The second one, con- death of the ringleader, the other side of the rabbit hole. That's kind of the redemption, self-help piece. Mm-hmm. So I'm writing on this one day, and uh, my head goes, blah, blah, blah. You're full of shit. You're no therapist. You're going to steer people wrong. What do you know? And I was like, Ugh! And I had had this dream, Spring Equinox 2017, and um, I was at this dinner party, and Brad Pitt was there. Now, he wasn't Brad Pitt, but he was Brad Pitt. Okay. And he was a rehab client of mine, and which was funny because this was before Brad Pitt got sober. So say what you want about that. But I was like, you doing any projects? He's like, not really. And in the dream, I had this vision of like almost a snapshot of a movie of different scenes. And the dream was so powerful, it woke me up and I recorded four voice memos to like capture the idea. So when... What a friend told me was my ego trying to thwart my writing process. I s- put that aside and was like, I should just do something like purely creative and like picked up this awakenings project that just flowed out of me. And then I stumbled and I broke and I came back and whatever. But it's seven characters. So it was meant to be like a novella, like a teaser novel to like do little character developments and think, okay, there's seven different characters. Somebody's going to like one of them. And then I can have prequels. I can have spinoffs. I can have graphic novels. Um, but it's these seven, some strangers, some connected. Um, and they're all sober. Um, converge in this so it's post 2016 election and the separation of wealth has gotten really grotesque so it's sort of dystopic like the opening scene in the first vision i had in the dream was these three shadow figures walking backlit by this beautiful sunset and a broken st louis arch so that kind of dystopic not um not like post-apocalyptic but that dystopic like things Mm -hmm. are not going well and you know the big cities are super rich the outlying towns are a mess but they all they receive this mysterious and for in invitation they all converge in this crossroads town which connects them all and then they move on together to the invitation so yeah i was blocked and shannon does did she ever talk about that nec neuroemotional coaching she does Mm. it's like this your body can't lie to you and she'd better explain it, but it's... She's doing it here in a couple of weeks. So. Yeah, nice. Yeah, ask her about it. Neuroemotional coaching. Is that, and, is that like, um, is that similar to NLP? I don't, what's NLP? Uh, Neuro Linguistic Programming. It might be. It's like to remove blocks. Yeah. So you have like a, I know it's, you have a, you start with a positive statement. So it was, I want to fish, finish my novel. So the first time we ever did it, which was the same day I met this jewelry maker, which is funny, like you put your hand out and she's like, resist, don't be crazy about it, but resist. So if I say my name's Scott, like I can resist. If I say my name's Eric, like your body just won't lie to you. So you do this statement, I want to fi- finish my novel. So if if you, if it just falls, it's like you don't and that's almost the end of it. But if you can resist, it's like, okay, and then we go through these series of exercises to remove this block. It's interesting. And I literally finished it like a week later. That's crazy. Yeah. So it's um, developmental edits. I just sent it to an author I met uh, Friday night and he's like, I'll read it because my friends and I love my friends. <laughs> Nobody's read it. <laughs> or they've read oh, they've it. Read well, no, it. my they, friend they Jess. told you they've read it. Yeah, my friend Jess read it. And like she was like, I read it in a weekend. And she got back to me. I mean, I've had people read excerpts. And I love it because it's all stream of consciousness writing. I sit down, I write it, close my laptop. Right. I try not to edit. Right. So everybody says, I can hear your voice when I read it. It's interesting. Yeah, yeah. So they're like, you have to do the audio book. And I was like, all you right. You have to yeah. read your own. Yeah, it yeah. pisses me off when authors don't read their own book. Yeah. 
It's not the same. Why is that? I I don't know. <laughs> they don't. I know. Well, them don't. I know. When it's time to record it, you, uh, maybe you can help me. <laughs> record the audio. I'm not, no, you're going to record the audio. <laughs> right. I'm going to record it, but you have all this <laughs> lovely able, equipment. We might be able to do it here. Mm -hmm. So... But yeah, what, I finished it. Okay. So who knows? We'll see. What's what is Rick? You changed your social media identity. I I added a social media identity. Okay. What is so it's recovery PA? So adventures and recovery adventures PA. Adventures and recovery PA. That is. What is this? So I'm and very close to developing a collaborative wellness nonprofit. Yes. I so think we touched on it just a little yeah. bit last time you were here. So it's called Awakenings Collaborative Wellness, which is why the novel is also Awakenings. I'm like, well, just throw it out there in all kind of forms. So it's like um, when I had Factory Artists, that was the first time I saw creative wellness. And that was a very, even though I was a bit out of my mind and drinking pretty alcoholically and doing, a, for me at the time, a reasonable amount of drugs, <laughs> um, it was a big spiritual awakening. Like that was a really powerful time. Because I think I started to see things differently. You know what I mean? Or like, maybe it was just the creative wellness. Maybe that was just the beginning of the path or something. I don't know. I saw things different. I did. And um, so when I first got sober, I'm standing in my living room. I'm like, all right, Factory Artist was this awakening. I am really obsessed with this idea of a spiritual personal development program. How do I fuse those? And it was like I sat in a field and was like, this is what I want to do. And it was like, all right, this is the journey you're going to go on the next seven and a half, nine years, whatever. It's almost nine years. So, And that was pretty early on. Um, but it's like a – it's collaborative wellness. So it's the idea of there isn't one fix. So Interesting. It's seven different sections. There's a section best based on Echelon and Big Sur that's like personal empowerment, corporate mm -hmm. wellness, things like that. There's um, a permaculture center. There's the vision quest work that I did. There's um, sort of um, like higher end sober living facility. There's factory artists, the creative wellness. And then there's adventures and recovery, which is the adventure based um, like what is therapeutic it, what does that mean so when i the one thing when i did the school lost borders vision quest one of their sayings was never underestimate the the power of mother nature to hold and heal your pain okay so when i first got sober like outpatient didn't work because i had too much freedom went to inpatient was like okay went back to outpatient and my therapist i was like what what am i going to do for fun because addiction's like i'm all you got I make you write and paint and do music and I'm all the fun you have. And she was like, write a bucket list. And I was like, all right. So I always wanted to go whitewater rafting. I was waiting for somebody else to schedule a trip. So I just did it. Like this was phew, God, probably 2014, 26 people showed up. They were all new sober friends. And I look, looked around, I was like, all right, anybody that's drinking is like, has no money to do this and isn't coming here on Sunday at 9 a.m. But it was like this powerful experience. And then, so we, you know, did a couple and then went out west. Okay. And one day a buddy goes, hey, you want to go whitewater rafting on the Rio Grande? And I'm like, yeah, how much? And he's like, free. I'm like, what? So it was this woman in AA worked with the Santa Fe Mountain Center, and which was a nonprofit, so she could use all their all their goodies. Certainly, certainly. So it was just, she just wanted to take people out and do adventures. And it was called Adventures in Recovery. And uh, I mean, we went rock climbing, we went whitewater rafting, like hiking, all these beautiful things. And I was like, wow, that was kind of the, the experience that I was feeling, you know, with all these sober people doing whitewater rafting. So I came back to Pittsburgh and I had no plan. So I like went on Facebook and was like, I need a job. And after a meeting one night, like we were hanging out and somebody was like, what do you want to do? What, what kind of work you want to do? And I was like, ah, it doesn't matter. I'll do anything. And I like sat back and then shot up and I said, no, this is what I want to do. And I like elevator pitched adventures and recovery. And a friend of mine was like, what are you, what is this? So it was like, I had this moment of like the, when I did the vision quest 2015, the vision was to develop this collaborative wellness nonprofit in Pittsburgh 
And then I ran away to Santa Fe. And now that all blended in the story and I grew it because of it. But that night driving home, I was like, oh, it's the story of Jonah and the whale. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Spirit gives you purpose. You ignore it, run away somewhere else. You're swallowed by the whale, spit out in the shores of where you're supposed to be. Now, to me, the Old Testament's parables. Jonah wasn't swallowed by a flipping whale. Mm -hmm. Maybe he was. I don't know. Some people (laughs) argue that. But it's a parable. Can you write it, you know, relate it to your life? So the next day, I called Whitewater Adventures and just act. I honestly acted like Adventures in Recovery was already a thing. And I like texted the woman out in Santa Fe and I was like, can I use that name? And she was like, yeah, have at it. So then it was just like, okay, we're just going to do this. <laughs> develop this beautiful woman helped me develop this logo and she was like newly sober. And like, I wasn't in her boat, but somebody else told me the story. During a calm part of the river, she looked around and said, this is so much better than my addiction. Mm. And I was like, boom, there it is, done, Mm -hmm. it works. So, I mean, we did whitewater rafting, we do yoga workshops, we jumped out of airplanes, hiking. Um, It's just using, taking nature as as the other therapist. And we'll do little, like almost, ones you don't have to think about so much, but little therapeutic things. So some of the therapists that were involved and are involved will be like, hey, try this or, you know, so a little therapeutic exercises, but nothing that's overwhelming. But it's just the idea that nature, go and they, Japan's had it for probably 10,000 years, but they have now in America, forest bathers. They just take you into the woods, man. Yeah. Go for a hike in the woods and try to be in a bad mood. Yeah, I get that. I get that. So that's the the basis of it is adventure based therapy, but that is one part of a section seven part section to try to develop collaborative therapies because there's so there's not one size fits all therapy for mm-hmm. anything, mm-hmm. and that was based on my experience getting sober. Like somebody early on sat down a water bottle, said, "There's my addiction. The more I put in between that and me, the better off I am." And he walked across the room. And I very addictively was like, okay. So it was, it's a lot of it's based on my own experience. It's based on seeing the healing power of creativity back when I had my gallery downtown. Yeah, it's what's the solution in America? You know, you're bipolar, I got ADD, she's got anxiety, you know, and and what's the answer? Take a pill. Yep. No, man. And even, even, I mean, we talked about this, even. I love AA, AA saved my life. I will send people to AA forever. But for some people, it's not enough. You need a therapist and maybe adventures in recovery and maybe you go do a vision quest. And, you know, the one example I always give of like the idea of awakenings, what I want it to be, you know, we'll say five year plan. 10 to 30 acres in a rural setting. So now when you go to a therapist, you drive up to a cement parking lot, you go into a building with fluorescent lights, you sit down and talk. This, you'll come on to this beautiful permaculture center that is a teaching center. Um, you'll Your initial consultation will be to take a walk around the grounds with me. And because I have wizard powers and people just tell me shit, <laughs> you know, you'll tell me your story and I'll recommend collaborative therapies. You know, so if you're a couple having problems in your relationship, mm-hmm. yeah, we'll sit on do talk therapy, but then maybe we'll do psilocybin therapy, dance therapy, That's what cooking I therapy. Ask you. I wanted to ask you about the. Um, it seems like a modern phenomenon. Maybe it's just not in the public now, but like this fascination with hallucinogenics now, fast, fast, and primarily mushrooms. Yeah, it's. The reemergence is modern. The reemergence of it, yes. I mean, you look at the cats. I don't think, again, humans mess everything up. So I don't think, you look at like the LSD experiments, man. You had Aldous Huxley, you had Timothy Leary. Like some of the greatest minds of all time fucked it up. You know what I mean? Because I mm. think we, we go too far. I don't. Who's the guy that, you can answer this question yeah. for me. Who is the guy that Steely Dan wrote the song about? What song? Um, Kid Charlemagne. I don't know. In San Francisco, and he, it's probably Leary. Uh, he, I Not Leary. I don't think it was Leary. They wrote huh. this song about this guy, and he 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 
created LSD. I guess. So. Oh, I can't remember that and cat's he, name. Yeah, and that's what it's about. I, yeah, it's about every the time creator. I hear that song must have been a great. Just that song is great on so many levels. Talk about jazz. There's an example of jazz mm-hmm. guitar th- mm-hmm. making it from in the in the pop world. Oh yeah, fascinating. Larry yeah. Colton, right? Yeah. But that story in that song is huh. just haunting. Now I gotta to listen me. to it. Yeah, it's it's the, it's basically the birth of LSD, I believe. Yeah, and that was like that guy was just a chemist playing with stuff, and then got all banged in. Like he didn't even mean to he figured it out. I, but yeah. I feel like he was doing. Crossed I feel the like he was with the pearl, whatever that means. But I think oh. he was. I feel like he was originally experimenting with psilocybin. I feel like he was, or it was sport. I don't know. His original thing was not in. I mean, it wasn't intended to do that. Well, well what's this? This certain thing where people are going away to these weekends out in the woods. well there's a lot of different ones well it's like it begins with an a oh ayahuasca what what yeah. is this ayahuasca phenomenon i mean right that's now? what I is mean, ayahuasca so ayahuasca is it's a root okay. and this is something used by shaman probably before recorded history mm-hmm. um i've never done it i are you compelled to do it if I can go. So when I first went out for my first vision quest, I met the woman who I'd end up uh, living with out there, and she was going to the Amazon with the archware people. And the archware people, forty to fifty years ago, if you'd have walked into their camp, they'd have killed you. And now the shaman had a vision on ayahuasca that the world needed him, and he needed the world. So they opened their borders a couple times a year to the Pachamama Alliance. And, like, you got, you take a plane in South America, and then you take a little puddle jumper, and you take a canoe down the Amazon. Like, these people don't know what plastic is, man. You know what I mean? And ha- if I can do it that way, yes. And, I mean, I've talked to my people, talked to my sponsor about it. Like, it's been... Like the vision quest was like, mm, cause I had a completely transcendental hallucinogenic experience, completely sober fasting in the mountains. It's interesting. Like the most hallucinogenic experience. You say fasting, life. like how long? 108 hours. Interesting. Yeah. And deep, deep ceremony. I had a transcendent experience. So when I came back, like that was on my radar a little well, bit just from meeting that? her. What happened to trans? When you say transcendent, how do you pronounce transcendental. it? Transcendental. Transcendental that, experience. That's, uh, who's it? Terrence McKenna is, and he's the one. Yeah. The big one no relation. I'm familiar yeah. with the guy. Yeah, right. No relation. I think he actually. He's brilliant. I think I was aware of him from name association yeah. decades ago as a young person. Yeah. That was that was so far deep I couldn't. I just. Oh yeah. I was like. Whoosh. Well, that was. I mean, to me, his work oh, uh, LSD God. led to his meditation experience, which is about you can achieve those things without drugs. Like Alan Watts has a great quote, um, hallucinogenics and psychoactive drugs, so including cannabis, were not meant to be done over and over and over and over again. When a scientist discovers something, he doesn't stay eye glued to microscope. He goes and works with what he's done. So we talked probably a little bit in the beginning of there's a purpose of drugs. Alcohol opened me up. You know what I mean? To be able to dance, to be able to sing, to be more social, you know. But I don't think these, there's a purpose to it, but I don't think it's meant to be done over and over again. Look at Fleetwood Mac, Aerosmith, hell, even maybe even Kiss. Like when they got clean or cleaner, their music got better. It got deeper. It got clean. It you got, think? I think, absolutely. Absolutely. Hmm. You know, you look at old shows like Aerosmith when they Steven play Tyler's better in. live. I know that when they're sober. Yes, but they write some unbelievable shit when they're stoned. True. <laughs> it's hard to argue Pink Floyd. That, I mean, you know, it's like I know, but were they stoned I mean, for all of it? I feel like I, most. Of I, it. I it would never be, surprise me if they they would be one of those bands that would like came back and they were like, yeah, we were completely. Oh, Zappa. Mm-hmm. Zappa was Zappa didn't do drugs, man. Yeah, but. Was was Zappa great? I mean, it's a very very specific thing. Was you either get him or you don't. Yeah, I mean, I, I think Zappa I, I was never, great. Yeah, no, right. you never, I just yeah. never got. I never did anything. It was deep. I respect his success and his. I respect his originality. That yeah, I respect, but I don't think it. It didn't resonate with me. Even if they did do that, don't eat yellow snow. Yeah, even 
I believe it's achievable without those things. I believe that the drugs unlocked things for them, but I believe if you would have taken the drugs away from Aerosmith and Zeppelin and all of them, they would have still done what they did. Even Hendrix because, and Floyd. Yes, absolutely. Floyd. Because it was opened. It opened. You know so what you I mean? said it Look was at the, good the, to use once to open not the Not once. Doorway. Not even once. I'm not even saying once. Okay. I'm just saying it wasn't meant to be. We're never meant to drop five hits of acid. We were probably never meant to do LSD because psilocybin is available. All those things are available in nature. You look at DMT. You know, ayahuasca is the mm. natural. DMT is like the unnatural, the chemically produced and like these, all these kids are doing DMT and like having God experiences in five minutes and whatever. But it's this like man-made chemical. But is it artificial? But, but is the experience artificial? That's a great mystery, man. I mean, going back to your original question, like, what is the deal with the hallucinogenics? We had the ayahuasca thing. Um, I think the the modern push, the modern like trend was the John Hopkins psilocybin research when they this is the modern psilocybin research and it was like groundbreaking stuff man they were working with like near death people and uh you know trauma and things like that and the research was so incredible that it just opened everything up and this was just you know this was psilocybin you know this was naturally derived um rather than like chemically produced and also in a controlled type of setting you know and um, the work was so amazing that um, they started a the next research project that John Hopkins did was with uh, like spiritual leaders. And it was so good that Harvard now has a deacon psilocybin program where the deacons Wait, eat mushrooms. What? Yeah, man, dude, Jordan Peterson, Russell Brand, like this whole rabbit hole. And it was like over a matter of a weekend because it's been kind of on my radar. Like, okay, if I can do ayahuasca in the Amazon with a shaman for a spiritual experience, that is not a relapse. You know what I mean? For me personally, if anybody disagrees with me, that's fine. We'll have a discussion about it. Or I can do, if I can do peyote with a proper Indian medicine man. You know what I mean? Like core root stuff. Okay. And I've really, really, really considered like microdosing psilocybin, you know? Really? The, I've done a tremendous, not dipping my toes, I've done a tremendous amount of work and like I still, and this is the human experience or whatever, but I'm trying to fucking levitate. Like I still get blocked up a good bit. And the the idea with this psilocybin thing is like a reset button. Like but, I haven't done it yet, the, but it's a consideration. The, the effect's supposed to last? Like you hear that... I, I don't know fully. I mean, ayahuasca, I think, is a decent experience, like a good amount of time. I think you could strap in. So you know. has the medical community ruled that there's no lingering side effects of doing this? Is there enough data to even make that declaration? I don't know. That's a, That well, shit scares me. It's Well, here's how far we've come Um Gina Vensel, who would be a really good person to talk to, is been really into like plant medicine, and she kind of opened my eyes. I was very curious about like cannabis's role mm-hmm. medically and also in the recovery field. You know what I mean? And for me, mostly on the hemp side, because CBD's got all the medical benefits without the psychoactive effects. And so I, you know, again, the universe brought us together. Not the shit clicked. you buy in the gas station. Yeah, no, no, not that. Like proper. Um, and so our worlds collided and we had some, you know, great discussions. And she was so, I was always worried about the legalization, even medicinal, about that. And I love hippies. I'm a hippie. But like, you got to handle, you got to handle your shit like a business. You can't just go crazy and just be smoking weed everywhere and just be like, Meh. You know, if you want to be legitimized, you got to handle it like a business. And Gina was always very like same idea, like no this. And she's since started to more tilt, well, plant medicine, but more the psilocybin. This research and development of psilocybin is so good right now because you had John Hopkins, you had Harvard, you had all these things that she believes that psilocybin will be legal in Pennsylvania before legal marijuana because they're handling it like a business 
Like they're wow. handling it properly rather than just being like, weed's legal, give it to everybody for any reason whatsoever. You know, and again, I'm a cannabis advocate, not for me. You know what I mean? Because I don't want anything to get in the way of what I believe is connection to everything. You know, and it's I I was a big cannabis advocate back in the day, like I was a big pothead, but like also a member of normal and gave speeches in college, pot first alcohol. I mean, I grew up in an alcoholic family like who gets what bad happens when you're high on pot. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's there fine. are some studies out there so showing there's some <clears throat> long term potential health problems. Though. Yeah. Well, and it is a psychoactive drug. And that's, I mean, the story begins there with me, this happy hippie who's like, pup makes you happy and hungry. And then even when I first got sober, I was like, I'll do everything y'all say for a year, but after a year, I'm smoking weed. And like a couple months in, I saw the guy, Albert Torsky, the, the God's rest his soul. We lost him. We got a good guardian angel. Um, but he had a good run. He was like almost 90. Uh, I saw him give a speech and he was talking about purpose and he, you know, beautiful speech on purpose. Google him, dude. Mm -hmm. Like I can send you videos. He was unbelievable. And, um, he said one of the most dangerous things we're facing, not only just from recovery world, but like a purpose in the human world is the legalization and the medical legalization of marijuana. So, I mean, don't listen to that part of the podcast and be like, what the hell is he talking about? It's fine. He's like, it's an anesthetic. It takes you away from your purpose. And I was like, Oh, Oh, certainly. And there's certainly, I mean, I know senators and doctors and lawyers who smoke weed. And it's not everybody, but like, if we really think about it and really talk to each other about it, you know, we have great ideas when we're stoned. Do they get done? And I'm talking about when you're smoking way too much weed. I'm not talking about using it responsibly, medicinally for anxiety or, or sleep or whatever. I'm talking about when you're really taking but too much. But it's such a, I know, and, and I'm, not, I'm not a proponent. I, I don't want oh, really? it, I don't want it outlawed because yeah. I, I think it definitely, first off, I believe in freedom. Well, yeah, so I really, decriminalization, I really don't right? Know. Well, for me personally, it's, um, it just, I feel I'm stupider when I do it, I don't find that I'm creative. I don't find that I'm, I don't find that I'm efficient. I don't find that the quality of my life improves. I can find the same humor and laughter by watching a Netflix comedy special as, my, as opposed to my buddy giving to me across the room because what he's saying is not really funny. I'm right. just stoned. I'm just, uh, well, that was like the, a big awakening. The I don't first, know. that's just me. No, well, it, but there's a piece to that. And if you loop that back around to the discussion we were having about musicians mm -hmm. and drugs, Mm -hmm. So you're able to achieve that laughter. Like the first Thanksgiving, I was sober. I didn't want to be alone. So I invited friends over. We played Cards Against Humanity. <laughs> like I was like, that was like stoned laughing. And now I found that sort of laughter sober. Right. So I mean, that sort Certainly. of the link between the two, like these That's things. why I have comedians on this show. Right? <laughs> these things are all achievable without substances. I'm not saying that we should. That they're that they don't have a purpose. I'm saying they aren't meant to be overused. No, and we I get as that. human beings overuse shit. Oh yeah, you know what I mean. So again, we're, I'm not we're gluttonous in general. I don't mean, yes. I don't mean gluttonous oh. entirely about eating and food. I'm saying we're gluttonous in our mindset. Watch the we're consumption. The bar scene in Fight Club with Tyler Durden and the narrator. Like he lays it all out. We're Celebrity magazines, a thousand television channel so again like i am a proponent but then i did work with gateway rehab in st Clair hospital and there were people showing up to the psych board with psychosis from medical marijuana because they weren't told how much to take like weed when we were growing up it's like four percent thc man there's like 98 rick simpson oils 98 percent thc it's a psychoactive drug so again cannabis proponent absolutely but we need a more responsible system and there's plenty of like um um dispensaries doing a great job but even i would love to get in with the dispensaries and bring a collaborative approach to that so don't just in the same way we can't 
as cannabis advocates, we can't point at big pharma and be like, oh, you're doing it wrong because you're just offering a pill and then we're just offering one thing. You see what I'm saying? Like, what's the difference on the base level if we're like, here's your weed and we're not going to offer you any other type of therapeutic advantages of this or here's a pill and we're not going to offer you any other therapeutic collaborations with this. Like I just, I think, and there are some that are doing this, you know what I mean? But I think as a whole, I would love to, once I get this thing off, that's one of the things I'd really love to do is work with um, cannabis centers and be like, all right, when a patient comes in, like, I don't care if you give them the pamphlet for adventures in recovery or awakenings, like let's offer them a collaborative approach, not just, you know, here, get stoned. Addiction. Yeah. People say you can't get addicted to marijuana. I mean, I've heard that my whole life. Physically. But, but the ones telling me that are always the big smokers. Right? Yeah. The average how, person doesn't have an opinion. Like, and how, how often do they lose their keys or their wallet? I, I just would make the argument that the, defined addiction, because you would, you obviously, sir, would have would have a better definition of of the addiction probably than myself. But if you feel compelled to do something for 20 years on a regular basis, mm-hmm. I don't give a shit what that thing is. You have an element of addiction to mm-hmm. that. Gambling could be whatever it is, right. Right? right? I mean, so to say weed isn't addicting is kind of, to me, fucking kind of stupid. Yeah. And it I think... can be... I think when people talk about that, they're talking about physical, like you can't overdose from weed. So it's, that's part of that. Are they sure? Yeah. I don't know. I tried a few times, (laughs) you know what I mean? I didn't try to overdose, but I mean, it's been a, it's, there's no study. There's no, there's no, no one ever died. You know what I mean? I know some people in my sphere, Scott, that have smoked a lot of weed for a long period of time and they haven't, they haven't amounted to much. They're, well, I mean, that's, I but that's, that, they're, they have not amounted to much. But that's, but that's the point I was trying to make. And again, for those pissed off right now, I am a cannabis advocate. Mm-hmm. That's my point is, does it take you away from your purpose? You know, I got buddies that like, yeah, the whole same thing. And man, he's a super like productive guy. Could he have been more productive? I don't know any you know super I mean? productive guys in my sphere that oh, really? they will see, talk I've about known, smoking consistently. Yeah, see, I've known like yeah, senators, doctors, lawyers. You know, well, some I people get, get some shit done. But, yeah, but would they have got more done? Well, I would think that there and are, are they drugs, the one are percent? Drugs that, there are drugs that will accelerate productivity. <laughs> sure, we I can't them, imagine we weed would kids. generally be one. Right. right, right, right. Well, that's but that's. The point I'm trying to make, and that was what Tversky was making, is it's an anesthetic. It takes you away from your purpose. To me, if you look at like big picture, one, the government would never would have made it legal if they weren't able to make money on it. So how long before Monsanto's growing our weed? And two, to me, it's a system of control. Because think about it. cash p- business, though. Oh, it's yeah. It's fucking ridiculous. Right. It's crazy. I mean, it's so basically you're attracting crime. Because it's a cash only business. What the oh the dispensaries are? My understanding in Pennsylvania. Oh, I didn't know that. My, my understanding oh. is that they are not permitted to use uh, credit card machines. Really? It's all cash. Oh, I didn't. Wow. So now they have to pay for protection and, and that's, security. Yeah. And so I, I, I've oh, heard I that the, 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 I've heard that. that the weed business, the legal weed <laughs> business in P- Pennsylvania, is not really that profitable. Mm. Because of all the different factors. And that, but that's, I mean, that's another element of like, is it being done right? You know, like I have friends who work at dispensaries and I have friends I love a lot that I have great respect for. And again, I believe in the medicinal benefits of it, you know, um, but could it be done better? And that goes, you know, it's. Well, there's no, medi- well, so you have a medicinal line, but then if it's legal, then. That yeah, would be, that would be like if they that'd be a, like if they if they legalized, let's say, Xanax, right. the well, derivative of Xanax tomorrow. Uh, so is Xanax still a medical use? Yeah, pharmaceutical. That, that's a really hard thing for me. You 
did I ever send you that TED that Johan Hari TED talk? Mm. It's um, everything you know about everything we know about addiction is wrong, which is a very misleading um, thing. But he was a researcher, and then had a family member who was addictive, and so went on this big research project. And he gives a brilliant TED talk, um, but he talks about I think it was Portugal, maybe decriminalized all drugs, and like addiction dropped, crime dropped, but then. We're talking about Portugal. You know what I mean? Like, that's a really hard... I personally do not believe in the decriminalization of all drugs. Um, there's a lot of bad drugs out there. I definitely believe in the decriminalization of marijuana because I think it's insane that we're throwing people... I mean, I... Agreed. I had some experiences, you know, in my stints, my short stints in county jail. Like, I remember meeting a kid, like... He had a pinner joint, got picked up by the, you know, task force because he was an inner city black kid, you know, and was it sitting in county. And then my buddy, the one I was talking about that's pretty productive, but a lifetime pot smoker, was at Cranberry Post Office, man, and like in line and dropped a half ounce out of his pocket. And like should have just walked out, but he kind of walked over the counter and guy taps him on the back and he ignored him. Guy taps him again, he ignored him. The guy flashed his badge. He had an off-duty cop behind him in line. He went home, mm -hmm. and he's a white guy in Cranberry with a half ounce of weed. Mm -hmm. He went home, yep. got a lawyer, pleaded it down to a summary offense. Mm -hmm. Now, which I think is right, but you can't throw the black kid with the joint in his Not sock in county and let the white dude mm -hmm. in Cranberry with a half ounce mm -hmm. um, go home. I don't. But the decriminalization of all drugs to me is like a ooh. Well, especially now with with what's you know you and, fentanyl, and I'm no expert on oh, all God, this. I'm just saying like so. I mean, yeah, I, it's that's it was a, all, drugs was always sketchy in terms of work. If it was illegal. Yeah. It was always yeah. sketchy, right? Unless you were growing it in a pot, right? And you At watched home. it grow right. your whole yeah. life, and, and then like, it was homegrown. Well, that's that good. Worth. But I mean, seriously, you have to be. How do I say this? You have to be a fucking moron right now if you are going to go to a party and snort cocaine. I don't give, I don't oh. give a shit if it's coming from your best friend because I wouldn't trust where they got it from. It's it's insane I mean, and, right now. Yeah. It's insane. It's, it's, yes. And it doesn't make sense. Yeah, it does. I don't. Yeah, I, I'm no expert at all. Like. So there's a difference between decriminalization and like um, some of Europe, Canada is doing it. There's talks of it in in the U.S. Um, of like safe injection sites, which I'm actually a fan of because these if you look at the way when these are done right, it's a medical facility. You know that it's you know that it's you're not getting fed. No one's going to die because it's done by medical like literally a nurse shoots you up. But. And I think it's the Russell Brand documentary He um, on, like, recovery. I don't, one of his things, he goes and visits this place. And, like, they are trying to make your life better. So you're not just going in there and shooting up. They're working with you to, like, get your life back together. So they're taking out the destructive element of the drug and the shame and things like that and the danger and peace like that. And you're actually in an environment where, like, people love you. You know, these strangers are trying to help you. So it's odd because it's like kind of a rehab environment, but it's it's like that harm reduction piece. You know what I mean? Which when I first got sober wasn't didn't understand would be a better way to say it. But now seeing a lot of things and seeing different things, it's like maybe maybe you get we got to try something else. Like Gabor Mate is this Canadian psychologist, and he's probably one of the world's foremost addiction specialists at this time. And uh, he's like, if you wanted to build a system to make a drug problem worse, you'd build what, you know, North America has. So it's like, can can North America institute a system like Portugal? No, our population's way bigger. And there's, a, there's so many factors that just don't make that real. But I think we have to look at things a different way. I would agree. I mean, I, you know, it, it's insane to me that uh, San Francisco slash Ugh. Oakland, what Los Angeles is going through right Dude. now. With, I mean, that's a different. It's a multifaceted sure. problem with homelessness. Sure. But, but in, within that homeless swath is a lot of drug use. 
and there's needles everywhere. I don't think that's the answer either. Just letting it be a free oh, for God, all. No. No, we it's need government. Insane. Well, it was um, Jordan Peterson. Well, they're shitting in the streets over <laughs> you know, there too. I mean, it, and that's being yeah. accepted now. It's he was. I remember listening to him, and like, if you don't, you can't listen to snippets of Jordan Peterson. You can't take somebody else's opinion. Sit down and watch of some course. of his shit. And you'll realize, like, wait a minute, this guy's that he's being mis- to he's it. often often being misrepresented oh, because of those who just listening to snippets, right. right? Yeah, or taking a friend's advice. Oh, he's misogynistic. Be quiet. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. But Indulge um, yourself. Educate yourself. He was the first one. Well, back in Obama's sec- when Obama was elected, I cried, man, because I was like, all right, maybe. Maybe this country isn't as backwards as I thought. Mm -hmm. But then he, like every other politician, didn't fulfill his campaign promises. So I was like on the fence for his second term. And my friend sent me a uh, like political test. And the older I get, um, well, I've always been moderate, but Mm -hmm. it turns out I'm a red dog Republican, just right of center. Or some people, I guess, would have told me libertarian that's kind of where i lie yeah kind of generally but i hate to label myself right i know and so but moderate Mm -hmm, and peterson is always trying to bring people to the middle absolutely but that was the first thing of going oh maybe like i'm evolving or i'm changing i'm changing because i won't even say it's evolving but stay moderate um yeah but he was like okay we know when the right goes too far like they're marching through charlottesville with torches he's like what about the left I was like, yeah, what about the left? Yeah, what does that look like? The far left, I should say. Yeah, the far left, like extreme left. Extreme, when, when the right goes f- too far, we know what it looks like. What about when the left goes too far? And uh, to me, California is a, 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 a reasonable example of that. We need governed. Like I had, a, I don't even think it was a friend. I was just think it was a customer or somebody I met. And they were out in San Francisco and they like had to go to the bathroom. I was there. Yeah, yeah. And the cop was like, just piss in that doorway. And the dude was like, no, you're going to give me a ticket. And the cop was like, we don't give anybody tickets for anything. And like to me, that's it going too far. I mean, there's other things like, like I think we're maybe, in India. maybe gender reassignment on 10 years old, 10 year olds yeah, might so, be a thing. Yeah. And like I said, and so that was so funny. I was driving here anticipating this conversation yeah. and I'm such a, um, I try to be indifferent to a lot of things that don't interest me, especially when I know mm. that I don't really have the tools or the want to really dive in deeply. Right. Like I have come so far from based on how I was raised and also just the era we grew up, I've come so far in terms of my own personal tolerance and not even tolerance, understanding. Understanding is a better of, word. Understanding of the gate. Well, first it starts with you have to learn tolerance when you don't have any. <laughs> you know what I mean? Then when yeah. you then when you start to understand, it goes beyond tolerance. Mm-hmm. But understanding of the gay community. Like mm-hmm. I was just it wasn't a part of it was in a part of my circle. Mm-hmm. But I but now I've got like over the past couple of decades, the most amazing friends in the gay community, which mm-hmm. I don't think about the gay community. There's my friends. Right. Yeah. But I can see the extreme radical nature of like gender reassignment, letting five year olds choose their gender. I, so where do you draw the line? And I'm not educated enough to, to make, to make medical decisions because I'm not, yeah. a, I'm not a person of medicine. Yeah. But when I step back, those are the type, the fact that, you're telling the fact is that we're having a conversation where there are people in this country that appear to believe or this world that a five-year-old can choose their sex now the sex what sex or what gender i don't Mm. know i can't have those discussions Mm -hmm. but there are some elements of the far left that are just as fucked up as the far right god yeah different Different. But fucked up. Well, look at Peterson started his original studies on Stalinistic Russia, Nazi Germany, and Maoist China. That's right and left. Mm -hmm. They can both go too far. Sometimes they end up meeting. Sure, yeah. They swing all the way around. Right, yeah, exactly, right. Um, So I I think that's an interesting time in our age, and maybe specifically in America, where, and again, someone myself who's pretty aware especially when it comes to the politics for him to say that me go oh and like almost like i think i paused it and was like thinking before because i knew he was gonna like give some examples um and that's you know one of the examples he gave and it's um i i'm not a psychologist or an expert in any way but like i think if you want to consider yourself open-minded 
and I'm not even talking about you, but it'd yeah, be good yeah. for you to have the discussion, but anybody, mm-hmm. and I don't care if you're super left leaning, if mm-hmm. you consider yourself open minded, listen to some of the stuff that he talks about yeah, when it comes to this, because he's talking about it from a clinical psychologist. Does he know everything? No. Do we know, do we have any idea what somebody's going through in their own body? No. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? But when you have those type of decisions that he in But does the, a five year old possibly have the mental wherewithal to know what the fuck is happening to them? And my answer as a logical human being is no. Right. And so that's don't try to convince me otherwise because right. I'm not gonna listen to you. <laughs> I'm just not. I'm close right. minded. A five a five year old can dictate to a parent that they want to have gender reassignment th- surgery. It doesn't yeah. the world's upside down, it in is. my opinion. It, uh, in that regard, in to that be, regard. Yeah, it appears to be. because So I'd lay this out, and it's – I love discussions. And I love whatever kind of source of information I'm connected to because it's like these things drop in. And it's like, oh, Certainly. wait. So if you're you, – you take that example, okay? And a lot of people get mad at you for saying that. But how oh, about well. – but Exactly. But how about this? You think it's okay to give a five-year-old – diagnose them with ADHD and give them amphetamines? That same person that would be mad at you for the comment you made will certainly say no. That it's not okay and maybe even argue you can't diagnose someone with ADHD because the brain does not de- start developing, it's stop all, developing until relevant. 25. It's, it's issue relevant, but aren't right? they similar Certainly. things? And look at what Certainly. we go to like – and I'm, I don't know. I don't know what it's like to be that person. I don't either. You know what I mean? Um, but but like, how does that five do, for your old know he's that person or I, she's that person? I, I'm, they, they don't know. I, uh, again, recently went on those stupid dating sites and, um, you know, connected with this woman and we're talking and, you know, we get to the, you know, hey, how she said something about kids. How old are the kids? 10 or right, 14. Right. And I was like, boys or girls? And she's like, two biological girls, but the 10 year old is transitioning. And my first thought was like, how the fuck? How? What? But who's making the, is the, I don't, and, like, I don't even want to come off the wrong way about this. I want to have more discussions. And it was funny because my one friend was like, it's not up to you and to understand. I'm like, okay, that part, like whatever that person's going through. But then if you, you know, for me to look at things and go, okay, well, does every boy who tries his mom's high heels on or every girl who wants to be a tomboy and play with trucks, you know what I mean? Like it's psychologically we go, and i'm not a psychologist <laughs> it, it, we go through these periods of like emulating the father emulating the mother you know what i mean like just trying i think overall like as humans one of the things i'm focusing on this point in my life is like balancing my energies you know i've always got along with the girls who have a you know have some guy in them and the guys who have some girl in them well, you know like more balanced like i never really and if you went to a sorority or frat, don't take offense because more than likely you didn't like it if you're one of these people. But I don't get along with frat boys or sorority girls. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like I get along with people who have the balanced energies. They're just people. Like why can't people yeah. just be people? But I just don't. And again, I, I, if someone is, is gender confused when they become 11, not only 11, 12, let's say 13, whatever that magical number mm-hmm. is. But I, they have a more. I think they'd be able to more reasonably articulate. Yeah. As a well, as made, a preteen, as opposed to someone at five years old. You made a good point, uh, and this is one of the things Peterson does a lot and very well. Where do you draw the line? Mm-hmm. What is? I mean, look at what we're going through right now. You know, like where's the line? Where's conception? Where's you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like even those sort of things. His to me, his whole thing is you're not. You're not um, pro-gender reassignment or or anti-gender reassignment. You're a thousand points of gray in between. So where, where, yeah, where is that? I want people to be happy. Oh my god! Yes. And if there's something, I don't profess that I'll ever understand it. But 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 I'm open-minded enough to realize that because I don't understand it, I can't scorn anybody. Right. But I'm one of. But but I would say they would need to be a functioning, relatively functioning adult. Of some capacity, mm-hmm. even if it's a teenager, mm. I can't. I can't give credence to a child 
well, that's to make what, a decision like to mutilate their body potentially through surgery right. even on a horm- whim, even hormonally, or whatever. But that's what I'm saying. If if you, if if you're a person and this part of this discussion is upsetting you, really listen to what he has to say. Like really listen. And I mean, a couple talks he did a whole thing with a uh, this New York Times columnist, and she was having people that had gone through the assignment and and like had regrets coming and she did a whole like study on it and things like that. Um, But I think to me, one of the bigger dangers in this is this like, is like identity politics. When we talk about Mm -hmm. radicalization, it's identity politics. And it's like, even the, um, even the idea of, and I'm, Whatever. All the women in my ni- life know who I am. Um, the my body, my choice. I don't think it's that simple. It's not. I absolutely agree with them. I think what's happening right now is fucking bananas. Like, it's bad, man. Like, it's bad on a really, really large scale. But I don't think it's as simple as, again, where do you draw the line? Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Because my body, my choice, like... Some of those people shouting it have never had an abortion. You know what I mean? Like it's we can't we can't understand what somebody's going through when they're pregnant. We also we also can't go out and try to murder the fucking guy just because we don't like his his judicial decision. But half oh god, half the country's okay with with Kavanaugh being being killed. They're okay. Oh yeah, that's so there's yeah. Just well, that's the danger. That's I mean, that's the danger of identity politics when you have that joined a team because even. For someone to say, "Well, you're not going through it. You don't under you don't un- understand." Well, I want it. All of this is seeking to understand. I'm not judging. I'm not right. saying anything's right or wrong. Right. I just want to have some fucking discussions about it. Yep. Because I think yep. we should be able to have discussions 100%. about it. Hundred percent. And and again, that's like a lot of it is our ability to converse. You know, or what I mean, in, or I inability can, to converse. Right. I can have. If I'm in the right place, which when it comes to discussions is a large percentage of the time that I'm able to reasonably discuss, even with a radical person, Mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And even if they go radical, radical, radical. I don't go back. Radicals don't. It's hard to communicate with with a pure radical. I know, but it's a lot of fun, man. It can be. If you can be cool, if you can stay cool. But ultimately, they they won't give you the opportunity to contribute to the conversation. But all so I'm fierce. all I'm trying to do is plant a seed, man. They're fierce. If you can get in, can there, I get right? And I'm can you get pretty in good at it. Okay, there you <laughs> yeah, go. Yeah, I'm pretty good at it. So I mean, it's but I mean, and also like it's you know some of the training I did with the Vision Quest was the art of active listening, mirror training. It's mm-hmm. like I, when I'm talking to someone, I'm watching their body. I talk a lot. Anybody that knows me of knows course. that. But I'm watching you and listening the whole time. Of course. So. Yeah, if I run up against a brick wall, then I'm going to peacefully be like, you know, we'll agree to disagree and move on our way. I just wish we'd be okay with being wrong. You know, yeah. like we just, we're wrong. sometimes we're wrong. So does it go back to, it goes back to ego. Humility. Like, right. You know, it's like, I, I mean, I, I, I believe, I believe that I fiercely, there's some things I fiercely believe in recently, and that's just that whole sure. thing about children. I mean, yeah, how can that's children a tough make one. the yeah, yeah. Well, to me, it's not even a tough one. It's so yeah. it's so yeah. illogical that we're, I yeah. think the, I feel the world's upside down. Right. But in the in that arena, there's a lot that I don't know, and I will sure. admit and tell you, I, I I don't know. It shouldn't be a fucking free for all. Nothing should be in any. <laughs> well, again, going back to California, Venice Beach. Like, I got a oh, friend out there right I now, know. and I'm like, go check out Venice Beach. And she's it's like, a no, I. Community. Right, man. And that was one of, like, that was the only part of LA I dug. Like, Venice Beach was amazing. And Venice Beach has been amazing since the 40s, man. Yep. And it's 100%. just, again, met a dude, and he was like locked in his ivory tower because he can't even leave his house because they'll rob it. Yeah. Like, I, I, we need governed, whether you like it or not. And again, the. Well, yeah, the, the, anarchy doesn't work. No. 
That's just, I, I, you know, I, you know I'm, I'm like, I love the Sex Pistols, man. I, but I will, I'm here to tell you, same thing that, that Johnny Rodden will tell you. Anarchy doesn't work. It was a song. Right. It was a fucking song. Well, it's a shake at the fist of the establishment, yeah, which and, no one loves that more than I, you know. Yeah, of, but, well, of course. But, but we pure need. Anarchy, you know, just as, a, just as pure capitalism won't work, mm. right? Pure anarchy, anarchy doesn't work, right? I mean, it's got to be, there's always got to be order to some degree you would hope there wouldn't be oppression with that order we got to fight against that right, we've watched that there's got to be order because mm -hmm. a free-for-all doesn't work man no because because no. the human nature takes over and we're just not good creatures given to our own devices no we're terrible i mean <laughs> to each other everything spiked or something to, a, to, our, to each like, other yeah it was when i my path of like um well, my path is spirituality, but my path of understanding organized religion a little bit more, I didn't grow up with a bad Catholic experience, man. I mm -hmm. was fascinated as a kid, but I had a father who encouraged questioning. We would sit down and we'd look at the book and he'd be like, right. ah, they made that up. Ah, that's a mistranslation, whatever. So it was always encouraged. I personally did not have a bad Catholic experience, but like anybody in their right mind is at some point going to shake their fist at the Catholic Church because mm -hmm. come on, it's the biggest mm -hmm. business in the world, atrocities, blah, blah blah mm -hmm. um but i remember it was during the gallery it was during this time of awakening and you know i was 23 or 24 when i left the church and me and my daughters were living in uh like a little apartment in swickley at the time went to ash wednesday and basically they gave the sermon about like jesus is like go in your room close your door i'll be there and i was like i'm out you know i don't need this building i never found comfortable in it you see what I'm saying? Like growing up a lower middle class kid. And I mean, I mean, I grew up in McCandless and went to NA and it never wanted for anything. But I was just like, what's all this marble? Like it's something wasn't right. I remember my dad explaining tithings, you know what I mean? And I was like, we're giving Yeah, we're that's giving a hard that concept money? in a Catholic yeah. church for sure. So it's um to rationalize. But I'm doing this rant. I'm hanging out with the 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 little uh parking lot attendant next to the gallery before i opened up we're smoking a joint we're listening and i think it was like yep sunday jazz or something he's playing his guitar and i'm like my whole rant and he just sat and listened and at the end of my rant i stepped off my soapbox and he was like scotty the organized religions a system of control and not only that without it the world would be chaos or eden we as human beings are not at the capacity for eden mm -hmm. You know what I mean? We are wild animals. We needed, I mean, and, and I was like, oh, and that made me relax a good amount. And then over the years, little by little, having some good experiences and, and talking, you know, I'm lucky enough to have like clergy friends and things sure. like that. Sure. And I mean, even my sponsors, just like he was like his parents were missionaries and I've met some beautiful people and even had some beautiful experiences in the building. And I think some of the way that modern religion, I think, is 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 a bit of an evolution where we're putting down that fire and brimstone bullshit that a lot of people grew up with. But it's, I mean, even going back to, I had a reading in October, and you know, one of the messages that came out there was good and bad in everything. Mm -hmm. You know, even in the book, one of the characters based on they're all it's me or friends of mine, and I'm writing the one character who grew up with an overbearing Catholic mother, and I have this like thought like. Oh, part of my bedtime story is like past lives. So I'm like old souls are born into strict religious or strict families because we need some structure. Because yeah. none of this shit makes sense. And structure is good in the beginning, but it also gives you a really easy reason to rebel. And to me, rebellion is essential in spiritual growth. So it gives you the structure, but then you can like be like... Pfft. Fuck it. Like, again, Johnny Rotten was shaking mm -hmm. his fist at the establishment. There's there's an importance to shaking your fist at any anything, I guess. But, like, mm -hmm. if that becomes your identity, then maybe... And you're unchangeable and radicalized and, mm -hmm. you know, that that's not Well, it becomes great. destructive. But the reason I told that long, convoluted story is, like you said, we're wild animals. Like, left up to our own devices, man. Like No question. The civilization of the world is, I mean, watch like the movie Gladiator. Yeah. Jesus, man. Sure. And we still have the gladiatorial contest, but they're not killing each other. Mm -hmm. Yet. 
<laughs> right? Yeah. Who knows? We got American Gladiators, that cheesy show from. <laughs> back. We have MMA. That's a thing. That's which, which thirty years ago when it first started, I remember saying to my buddy mm. looked across the table, barred him. I said that will never fly. Oh, that, really? That in the cage, like yeah. Everybody was into it, and I'm like that brutality, oh, and that, I mean, that'll never. That, yeah. that's never and is Dana White like? Well, I guess he's not. Was he? He's the. I, I guess he's, he's the, one of the guys. I guess one of the guys who started because it was it, my buddy Mitch is really into that stuff. And he knows right. Yeah. He he like he, made, he UFC, professional right. Yeah, professionalized. I mean, I got, it. You know what? If it listen in the end, if people dig it and that's their thing, God bless them. I find it. <sighs> I find it casually amusing once in a while, but I'm not involved with it. Doesn't see. I the, can't. the violent thing is like even like boxing for me. I grew up with boxing, but yeah. to me. It's like as I've gotten older, I have moved away. I'll tell you, I moved away from violence to, for sure, for the sake of violence. I don't mm-hmm. even like football anymore because I just, you know, I just, I, I think there's a lot of a lot of violence in there. I, I, I really, mm-hmm. I think that in the and maybe the, not just the violence, but the intimidation that goes around the mm-hmm. violence. Mm-hmm. It doesn't do anything for me. Mm-hmm. Maybe I didn't play. I don't know. Maybe that's why. I don't yeah. know. For me, a big hit. And Ooh, this might, I don't care. you might like identify this. And it was funny because I remember seeing that same Torsky speech. I think he talked about how he can't really sit down and watch a sporting event very long because he's like, there are better things to do and focus mm-hmm. on. And for no, me, right. that's it. Not he's even right. the violence. For me, it's like that, you know, that. I mean, there's great lines in that movie Gladiator about, you know, give them blood and they'll love mm-hmm. you forever or whatever. But to me, it's it's just another. I don't want to be distracted. Yeah, it's. I have shit to do. Well, and that involves yeah. trying to awaken people, man, like it trying to raise the vibration just, of the human race. <laughs> well, it, it, go, it goes beyond uh, just sports. It goes to, you know, television is, you know, there was, was that song, Blow Up Your Television, or there was an album, uh-huh. Blow I mean, that, that was the solution. We never did it, but. Well, that's what's you know. amazing to me is, I mean, uh, Ald- Aldous Huxley warned about it in Brave New World and Orwell mm. reiterated I gotta, I gotta the thought that. of oh, Orwell. Re- t- it's called TV programming, people. Yeah. Programming. Like. And now there's thousands of channels of it. Yeah. And we're just like these just drooling, just like, okay. 700 you know? channels and again on. i like watch all kinds of stuff man i love but i need i think mm, yep i'm gonna go with need right now i need an escape oh yeah oh my god yeah like it, it's it was it was part of my go coping mism growing up like growing up in an alcoholic family where like my dad was the like Happy alcoholic, but my dad traveled a lot. My mom was like a really, really Jekyll and Hyde. It was not good, man. Good. You know, and so that was like the woods. Yeah. And and TV were big escapes for me. Good. Like, uh, did you ever see Scrooge with Bill Murray? Yeah. It's like one of my favorite. But remember when they go back to the house and he was like, oh, I had tons of memories. And he was like, I did this and I hit the ball and I asked. And he was like, no, that was TV. Like, that was. It was definitely an escape and still is, man. Like, I I am so plugged into, well, just fucking, I'm just aware, man. And they'd call it ADHD and they'd try to give me high-grade amphetamines for it, which doesn't work. I tried them recreationally. <laughs> it's not a good thing. But it, I'm just, I, I'm aware, you know what I mean? Don't you think it kills creativity? What, TV? Just oh, and plugging, it, oh, plugging into something. Well, see, look now. Wait a minute. <laughs> Earlier, you said Pink Floyd and them wrote great stuff because I think so. Yeah, but now you just said doesn't plugging in I think, create kill I, creativity. I think w- when you're enslaved to your inputs, they created inputs. But when you enslave yourself to an input, which is so like when you, dialing into a television, oh, staring at it you, oh, you are talking about television, that dulls not drugs. your own creativity. Oh, I thought you were talking about the amphetamines. No, no, I'm talking about like, like, like turning the TV on and sitting there for three hours. 
to me, that dulls human creativity. Now, will you get an idea off a TV show that will spark some kind of creativity thing? I guess it's possible. I'm guessing most are probably getting something out of the refrigerator or a bag of potato chips and mindlessly watching a show and then the yeah. next one and then binge watching, right? No, I don't think anything creative for you is coming out of that experience. In my opinion, I could be wrong. Sue me. Yeah. But, but I think that we, we plug into these inputs and we limit our ability for creativity. It's funny because just while you're saying this, like I'm having this moment of going, your experience isn't everybody else's experience. So mm. I'm a fucking, I'm a lunatic, man. Like I watch a movie and I'm like, bah, 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 like watching every piece and I'm I looking, I'm watching it as if these are messages from I'm beyond. Get, I'm guessing you know most I mean? people don't do that. No. <laughs> and I also have found myself in the past few years i can't watch mindless stuff like there's got to be it's got to be something that's got that's got some depth it's feeding your mind yes so i can't and i'll know rather quickly and turn it off so even that became my experience with sports you know what i mean and um i still i would i mean i love to go into a pirates game but it's more like it's a beautiful atmosphere and I do really, really like hockey. Now, when mm -hmm. I say really, really like hockey, I watched two hockey games last year. You know what I mean? Um, I like going to a hockey game. Um, but so that was it with sports first was like, no, there's no, I can't, I'm not getting anything. I, I'm not feeding my brain. Right. So then that moved right. into like programming for me. Like, you know, if it's not, if, it, if I don't feel like it's fueling creativity, and that, I mean, that's the same thing with fucking conversations. Absolutely. Like, come see me at Kingfly. We're going to talk about the nature of everything within five minutes, man. Like, we are not talking about sports. So I got no time. That's why I love this and you. Mm -hmm. Like, we're not going to talk about bull. I got no, no time. And most of my shows are that way. Oh, God, yeah. I love every one of them I watch. Yeah, you have, we're, like, we're really, there. really good I mean, People. there's once in a while there's superficial stuff on there. Once in a while, you need a break from reality too. You can't go. Well, that's that, every the, that time. can be the for me. That's the like television. Yeah, and it's like mm, it's funny. I heard a friend. I hate the fucking Kardashians. Yeah, I hate everything about them. I, I think that, I, I hate. They, every, they look like mutants to me. They've manipulated that, very, so many parts of their bodies now. They don't look human. And I don't even think their dad would like them. To be honest. And I don't know anything about him, but like, I don't know. He seemed like a cool cat. Like, he just seemed like, he was one of the things that was like attractive to me about law. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, those are, mm -hmm. lawyers are actors, man. Like, mm -hmm. there's, there's like creativity. Well, let me say trial lawyers. Mm -hmm. There is a, that is a stage, man, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and I don't think he'd even like them. But my friend was like, oh, well, I just watch it to check out. And I'm like, I like was like, all right. I didn't bust her balls about it. But, just, not, but examine that statement for a second. Yeah. yeah. And I, I, now, listen, there's no right or wrong. I'm just saying when you examine the statement, that is not how I want to spend my time going forward to my last years. I don't mm. want to be just checking out. But how do we, if you, and I imagine... You run at an octane like I run at. Kind of. I need. How do you how do you wind down? I take walks. Okay, that's beautiful. Long walks, yeah. which is also a, a physical aerobic benefit. Right. Um, once in a while, I will put. I'll lay down and I'll put headphones on, and listen mm. to music. Yeah, but so that usually puts you me got to all sleep. the good. You got puts all the good. Sleep. You got all the but good. I, but to sit, but to sit there, but to sit there and just stare at a screen because mm. I have to do that for my work, and I stare at a screen uh, when I edit these shows. There's, yeah. I already have some of that yeah. in my life, but that's the. I, I just, I, I just don't want. Like, I have a hard time going to. I, I want my son wants to go see a movie, and I will do it because it's my son. But I have a hard time going and committing. 90 minutes to two hours to something like yeah. that. Have you and Shannon talked That's about this? hard. Because she, like, she is definitely one of those can't sit still. You guys are a lot alike think, like yeah, that. Probably. Like, I don't. Well, I've never seen a movie with Shannon. And it was funny because I went over there one night and we were talking about like uh, watching a show. And we were trying to figure out. Oh, we were talking about like the combination of Will Ferrell and that other guy. Oh, Step Brothers. Yeah. We were talking about funny things and. 
she was like, I've never seen Teleday and Nights. I'm like, oh my God, Teleday and Nights is great. So we were going to sit down and watch it. Ricky was, Bobby. Yeah, she's like, um, I will be asleep in five minutes, so just watch whatever you want. And again, I ended up watching Benjamin Button and was like, you know, had a whole experience because of it and like had this, see, it'll do, it'll get me going and it'll be like, well, I watch this because my belief is everything happens exactly the way it's supposed mm-hmm. to happen, you know, so mm-hmm. it'll be like, I mean, there was a there was a part of that watching that not only like kind of boo hooing over the 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 beautiful love story mm-hmm. and Hollywood induced whatever, but there was an age part of it for me because you watch things and they affect you in different ways. And I mean, I'm 49. I'm going to be 50 this year. I'm really into most of the aging process. Sure, and, and that's. Like we said in the beginning, that's the. I feel like I'm getting a little more connected. I'm actually getting more open minded, which can be different sure. for other people. But like my, bo- all the shit that's happening, my body isn't great. That's not. So there was this like introspective look at like aging just because of watching Benjamin Button. So, and again, most people aren't like this. Um, but yeah, the, 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 the like checking out piece. I mean, I checking out like I I, I, I know my, I know when I drive and I listen to music, my mind kind of like relaxes. And, but but I think that I'm just wired in a way, especially yeah. these past couple of years. I just don't want to. I think it's accentuated now that I am sober. Like yeah. the last mm. two and a, two years, two and a half sure. years, whatever. I mean, I it, that in, that is more that has accentuated the fact that I have to be mentally engaged in something, or else I'm just edgy and not happy mm-hmm. I, I can't well, and that like broadens like the like the meditation piece you know what is meditating is it sitting mm-hmm. like buddha is it just somewhere where you're not in the past and you're not in the future you know what is that regret of the past fear of the future maybe yeah, yeah i mean well keep it you know keeping your mind busy i don't know i for me i feel like it's a combination of things because it's like I have no, I, I'm trying to figure out the great mysteries of the universe. Mm-hmm. Honestly, it's like people laugh at that, but like, I'm not joking. I'm trying to raise the vibration level of anybody around me mm-hmm. because I had all these unbelievable people and all these unbelievable experiences that have brought me to a point in my life where I was like, all right, man, this is feeling really good. It's funny driving here. Um, like I had a, you know, the creative wellness thought and, and, and I had this thought of like, you know, if you're going to be like, how are you? And to me, like today, you posted that question on Facebook about, do you like your job? Mm-hmm. And I think my answer was about percentages because mm-hmm. that's what life is for me right now. It's like, and I was like, 80, 20, if I'm 80, 20, that's good. Right. You know, right, right, right. And, and maybe even 70, 30. And that's in life and in work. And like right now, man, like I feel and it's not just based on me. I have this unbelievable group of people around me that if I'm going through shit, like they won't let me go through shit right, alone. Right, right, right. And now, you know, I had this experience, woke up on my day off um, before my alarm, you know, feeling good, like jumped on social media, jumped on the dating app. Within minutes, I'm like, I'm undesirable. And instead of letting myself, yeah, this fucking thing suck. I need a dating app sponsor. My friend Jean in Santa Fe said she, she was my former dating app sponsor, but then I stopped using her and relapsed oh, on dating man, apps. That's funny as shit. But I immediately texted Shannon and told her the whole experience and her response, which was very simple and is now my mantra when I don't feel good about myself because I'm single, was fuck those who don't want us. Mm-hmm. And it was just like, but that has been, I mean, a longer process, but consciously, you know, four or five year process of going through depressive periods, going through downtime, you know, and, and they and, and they got shorter each time because I started to learn, oh, the minute you reach out to someone, you're not alone. And right. even though, I mean, I was taught right. that beginning in AA, but then it's like, oh, apply all these things in real life. No, fuck. How yeah. am I supposed to do that? But now that's it. So literally, like, man, it's a pretty good, like, flow state. Sure. Like, I feel good. Work sure. will fuck me up just because 
I don't like working for somebody else. I don't like anybody telling me what to do. And mm. that's, you know, and most humans don't. Yeah. And I can identify what's my part. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? The, and, the, and I'll, I'll, I'm the like ask for forgiveness, not permission. And if you do that so many times at a job, then they're going to start to like try to collar you oh, or sure. put you in a box or restrict. Sure. In the minute you do that, like go ahead and put a bat, bobcat on the leash. Like that's what I feel like. The 100%. minute anyone tries to wrangle me, yeah, I, I get go it. bananas. No, no, I get that. And that's a mixture of, you know, my shit and their shit. I get it. it. Colliding. I get it. You know? I get it. Which eventually, hopefully, I can just work for myself and, you know, we'll we'll do the thing and we'll see. And, Did you have a good time, uh, bud? Yeah. You always have a good time. Like, I know. It goes by so quick. I'm still, I'm I, 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 I still really want... I know that we have our, like, little friends, talk with friends thing, yes. and I love Rachel and Shannon definitely, but yeah. I so want to get me and Sam D. Batista and you in the room together. Because, <laughs> like, I love you. I love him, and I just... Like when me and Sam sit down and shoot the shit, Sammy. man. Like it is that cat. Sam, I still need to get a fourth, but I I'm not yet. I'm not doing triads anymore. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna no, no. Thing. Well, that's how I was. See- yeah, but the re- you know what? Though? I came to that conclusion because it wasn't readily apparent to me until the editing process after doing two or three of them. I'm like, the vibe For is not. Different. I don't. F- no, the vibe. The, I'm giving is not engaged like I am when there's four. Yeah. It's like there's out of balance. We should all like. It's a weird We thing. should have a group message between the three of us and come. I'm sure. I would Shannon, like, I mean, Shannon, I think would be a bro. Shannon would be, I think, a brilliant fourth to anything. Because Shannon sure. knows Sam. Yeah, that might be good. Sammy's overdue here. You hear that, Sam? Yeah, I hear You're that, overdue, Sam. Pal. coming for you. Yeah, and I got, it's funny. There's a, there's a, this has been a really cool experience because there's been a group that have, has come out of that Sam Vivo crowd. I Nice. Katie Smith and some other folks I've met yeah. through that process, too, that then have... It's just... This has been a crazy fucking journey. Yeah. Like, it just... I can't... Ex- and and it, the tough part about this now is we were talking before we started, like, it's flattering that people know of it it's more flattering that people want to be on it Mm -hmm. it's difficult to explain that you know that it's by invitation only because i need to curate the experience because i'm not doing it for monetary gain if i want to spend enough time but also i don't want to disqual i don't want to hurt anyone's feelings or make them feel unqualified because there is no qualifications outside of where I want to be and the vibe that I well, get. Well, that's what I dug the experience. It's hard to explain that to no. pe- though. You know what I mean? Like people get offended so easily now. Yeah, I guess I, I so. I don't want that. I just don't. It's fun. I mean, it was fun to watch the experience because like Shannon, you were like, hey, you got anybody I should talk to? And she was like, Scott. And then like me and you got together and that was like, the, but, it was the vibes. Will this be good? And then I made the mistake of being like trying to, because I get excited. And I'm like, well, talk to this person. Talk to oh, that yeah. person. Oh, yeah. But you're not there. Yeah. And some work and some right. don't. Like, yeah. and, 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 and that's where I think everybody I've asked that question has been very respectful. They, they give me suggestions and names and some yeah. things I, if I'm going to, and I would hope anyone would live this way, but especially now at my mid 50s, mm-hmm. if I'm going to spend significant time with somebody, mm-hmm. I got to want to be in that conversation. Mm. Because I because it isn't about it's selfish yes but it's not completely selfish I need to be doing justice to the other person yeah if I'm just putting someone on a show here because I think that's going to get me views mm. or they're, they're what they do is unique in a way that I may have no interest in but in Pittsburgh it's popular so yeah I don't care no. about that because I don't care but, ultimately who's right. the volume of people if we're resonating with people I love that fact. But the reality, what's happening is right here. Yeah. Well, that's, that's what I think comes it, apart, you know, comes across. And I think, I mean, I know because I think I, I understand. I think we have very similar brains. So like watching, it's so funny because I'll, as we talk about these groups and these friends, I mean, obviously mm-hmm. Sam, because mm-hmm. like we're buddies. Um, but like a lot of your podcasts, I'm like, man, I'd love to sit down with that. But like, who's, who's Julie and who's that crew? We've talked oh, about this Ju- before. Uh, yeah, that's my squad. I yeah. know the squad. I was like, every time I see that, I'm like, that was oh, nothing man, but, I want to hang out with and the squad. And that was nothing but an experiment because I, every time I was with, um, Julia Mulligan, because mm-hmm. she was doing a UFO that show that took yeah. off with us. And that was like an eclectic group. But then I met Jerry, her husband. Yeah. And they were friends with, with Cassidy, who was more yeah. stoic. 
Right. Uh, and, yeah. and I said, hey, let's, we're going to put a four friend series yeah. together. That was the very beginning. Oh, that's and why. Then, and it's, well, it's But it's then cool... the conversations were so good and the feedback we were getting from people mm-hmm. was amazing. We did it again and again. And it's again. funny because I don't know any of those nuts. people in real life. Like, I think I was like Does social anybody? media friends. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think media I was world, social right? media friends with Julie first. And I was just like, like her and her husband. I'm like, oh, they seem cool. Very. And then it, I think Cassidy was watching on the podcast and I was like, oh, man. Uh-huh. Like, I, that's like one of those, like, I want to be friends with you in real life. Yeah. And, <laughs> that, and that's what that four friends thing has done. Yeah. It's brought people. Now, in that circumstance, as in with the show that you did, yeah. you knew those folks. Yeah. But I've had shows where I curated three other people oh, to sit really? at the table that didn't know each oh, that's other. That's cool. But I thought they would kind of be an interesting conversation. Yeah. And it turned out, knock on wood, it's worked. I would be open to that as well. You throw me in there, whatever. I have, you want. yeah, we'll talk. I have some, yeah. I have some ideas here. But nice. that whole concept was just, uh, and believe it or not, that was not really a deeply planned thing. I just said, That's listen, awesome. these one-on-one shows are great. I don't like it when I have two-on-one because I'm, mm. I, 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 I never really know. If 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 you're over, like if I invited you and yeah. someone else, you and Sam were here, yeah. Because we all know each other, it wouldn't be uncomfortable. Right. But let's just say I had two people on the other side of the table I did not know. Mm -hmm. I was interested in both of them and how they interrelate with each other, Mm -hmm. whether they know each other or not. Yeah. Invariably, I'm looking right here. Mm. I have cameras and stuff here in the center, which are necessary for my production. But yeah. it's it's a different vibe. And that right. guest is not going to feel as and then engaged. Adding that that changes it. You put the fourth one here, then everybody's equal footing. Yeah. The, the main if you put two here though it seems like it's a it's they're left event. out yeah they get left out and it's it's uh, not visually when we produce the show but the actual content that of the show. makes sense that's where the, the weird vibe came i think when i looked at it like mm. the triads don't work like the i always mm. do it one-on-one or i'll sit or down four. with four yeah that's the way to do it I yeah think. Yeah, I dig Anyways, it. Anyways, thanks. But buddy. yeah, we're, thank we're, you. This is the, we have plenty of opportunities for you on this show. I can assure you. Oh Both yeah, head to head anytime, dude. For, for friends, I man. just it's so much fun. You're like, good, well, you're good. You're definitely a good person yeah, to speak with. Yeah. All right, yeah. pal. Thanks, brother. All right, guys, gals. Cheers. Scott Burke, we are out. Adios. Salute. <laughs>